Hello, fellow co-hosts. Thanks for being here. Oh. So, I'm glad to see you again, Mauler. It's been a while since we've done this, you know. So, once again, <laughs> great to have you while. back. Like <laughs> you just got over the hangover, and then you're like, "All right, let's go again." Hair of the dog and all that. It'll be fine. <laughs> and hey, oh, it was fun. We watched a movie last night, didn't we? A really, really we neat did. One. It was it was really good actually. I enjoyed that one. Can I tell people what it was, or has that got yeah, to be all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it won't be out for a, at least a year. So. Yeah, well, I mean, I've reviewed it already. Uh, did the Last Samurai and thought it was fantastic, and um, we got a chance to watch it for EFAP movies, and you know, did. comment on it all the way through, and we were just loving it. So. Uh, Plenty of yeah. fun. Yeah, so it was all good. Uh, but yeah, anyway, we've got a few things to cover tonight. All it's all changing the world of DC. Um, James Gunn is working his, I don't know, is magic the right word? He's doing uh, something. <laughs> something's happening. He's doing things, yeah. Uh, and yeah, yeah. Um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge is going to be having her input into Lara Croft. Uh, we've got Picard Season 3 on the way. Uh, so yeah, we've got a bunch of fine gentlemen here that can guide us through all of this stuff. So why don't we start bringing them in? What do you reckon? Well, yeah, I'm on board. Let's do it. I think it's the right thing to do. All right, first up, we've got Jeremy from Geeks and Gamers. Hey, man. Hello, hello. Good to be back. Uh, always a pleasure um, to be with the drinker. And again, lifelong dream to stream with Mahler. Um, so I get to relive this dream a lot. Nice to meet you, Enjoy Jerome. Stuff. Nice to meet you, uh, Mahler, long man. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, uh, so you guys watched rewatched The Last Samurai. Is that is that what you said? We did. We did, oh, yeah. I love that movie. I haven't seen it in a long time, but I love that movie. So I'm, I'm assuming it held up. I'm assuming oh, it yeah, it it's really well, yeah. yeah I think I it, particularly the even just the first five minutes, we were just commenting like, wow, this is like really good character building, really good like introduction to best. everyone. <laughs> I was yeah. actually like kind of floored by how much character you get in about two minutes. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, now, now you guys may want to rewatch it again. It's been a long time since I watched it. That's a yeah. really good movie. It's a really good movie. Uh, yeah, it's like almost twenty years old now. I can't. Mm -hmm. it's, man, it makes me feel old. It really does because I still think of it as a relatively recent film, but it's I know. not. And then the fact that Tom Cruise doesn't age because he's drinking the blood of Scientology children. You know, we all officially like, hate him. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, he's, he's like meant to be a chronic alcoholic in this, and he's like the best looking alcoholic in the world. <laughs> that was a comment made when we were watching this. It. Like, it's incredible his ability to portray a human being. It's just, <laughs> yeah. how does he yeah. do it? <laughs> uh, uh, but... Yeah, good to, good to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, we were all appreciating your funky new background as well. It's looking great, man. Yeah, yeah. Mahler was like, "What's going on?" So yes, we are. I'm. I am at Geeks and Gamers headquarters in Orlando, Florida. We uh, just uh, got everything relocated down here. So exciting times for us. Uh, a lot of content changes, but yeah. So let's uh, got a let's big blue it. laser. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, it's just so it looks like a uh, it looks like a, a, a lightsaber, but it's just it's just lights. So, um, but it looks you know, cool. That's what a lightsaber is too. Yeah, it's just laser. <laughs> just, just, a, just a laser sword. Just a laser sword. <laughs> <laughs> we have also got because we need some comic book experts here. So we have got Eric July. Hey man, what's up? What's up, man? It feels good to uh, of course be back. It's been been a little bit uh, since since I was last here, and obviously uh, this is this is always fun. I mean, me and Jeremy do streams like every day it seems like so <laughs> that necessarily isn't anything new but obviously to be back here is certainly always always fun especially considering that all of what we got going on in the industry and like you mentioned uh g gun and whatever the hell he's trying to do with the dcu yeah yeah i think yeah i think the last time we had you on the ripiverse had just launched yeah. and like yeah. you, you were still in celebration mode so yeah. man yeah yeah, uh, yeah big yeah. congratulations for how amazing that's doing man it's uh it's brilliant Thank stuff you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, we're still still working. Um, Isom Two is about done, um, so yeah, we're working. We're working. We'll be back on back on the campaign trail again for 
uh, pre this uh, pre-order campaign for ISOM too. So I'm excited. Brilliant, man. Um, and we have also got Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Welcome aboard, sir. It's Thank great to have you back. Thanks for having me. You know, uh, it's good to see Jeremy again. Mahler, of yeah. course, always great to see you. And I, Eric, I have to say, uh, I really admired your Kickstarter campaign and, and taking things into your own hands and just carving your own destiny. You did a fantastic job with that crowdfunding campaign, and congratulations. Appreciate you. Appreciate you, man. Thank you so much, man. It means a lot. A lot of people in our corner, man, uh, side of the internet is uh, obviously giving, giving us well wishes and you know, y'all were the people that obviously helped to gain legs. Everybody just kind of talking about it. So it's it's, it's, it's it's just really shows how much power we do have, uh, certainly uh, when people get behind any project. So it's exciting. Well, and the fact that you did it, I, I thought the way you went about it was pretty genius. I've been involved in a few Kickstarter campaigns, and you really did a, did a crowdfunding campaign that was first rate. And I would I would advise anyone to look at you from a business perspective of how you handled it. It was done expertly. Appreciate that. Thank you, man. Yeah, it's good to be on with Robert too. Robert's one of my favorite people. Uh, yes, yeah, Jeremy. Good, good to see you again. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, you know, it's funny we had a we had a great stream and uh, a lot of ripple effect on that, but it was it was great. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of people upset that me and you who disagree didn't argue. We just spent two hours talking about everything we loved. Uh, well, amazing concept. Well, you know, when the drinker asked me to come on the stream, uh, we were talking specifically about The Last of Us. And The Last of Us has become, this last episode has become so divisive. Mm -hmm. and, you um, can say that, yeah. And, but yeah. <laughs> Mahler and Drinker, you, you both liked the episode. So I thought it was an interesting topic yeah. to discuss. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. man. Yeah. Dude, I think uh, on Real BBC, that's how I introduced my uh, uh, perspective. Was I? I'm I'm friends with so many people across social media. I saw it split like right down the middle. It, you mm. never know. Next person's like liked it, but hated this, or loved it, or I absolutely hated it. I was just like, whoa, this is created in like every response you could get, pretty much. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's uh, I've talked about it quite a bit uh, on my channel, and and I've said like as an episode in isolation, I thought it was really good. I thought it told a good story. I thought it had good pacing. I thought it had good emotional value. Um, but there's a bigger aspect to it that I thought was counterproductive to the overall story. Um, but, yeah, it, it is very divided. I mean, I, on my video, I, I have never been ratioed on, on YouTube, fingers crossed. This one came close. But it has. <laughs> more, but while I don't have a negative, and it's nearly negative, but it has more comments than likes. It's wow. got like 7,000 wow. comments on my video. It well, is it's also, crazy how how divisive this episode is. Go ahead, Robert. But they used they used material that was definitely inherent in the first Last of Us game. You mm -hmm. know, it was there, and they they extrapolated upon it. And I think that Craig Mazin coming off of Chernobyl, uh, which is one of the great modern miniseries that we yeah, really love that show. It, it really was it. it was incredibly well done, and to see the quality of of writing. I mean, you know, we as fans were always complaining about about how adaptations are not done well, but the fact that Neil Druckmann teamed up with Craig Mazin to do this is, is what I'd like to see more of in terms of having IPs translated from one medium to another. And while I understand Take the Last of Us 2 out of it, um, you know, the, 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 the fact that they brought, I mean, Neil co-wrote the, uh, the first Last of Us game, and the fact that HBO allowed them to team up to do this and that Mazin, it's been interesting because if you look at it, Craig um, Mazin co-wrote the first episode and directed it, and then Druckmann uh, directed the second episode, and then Mazin wrote this episode, and they brought in a third director. But in terms of getting this kind of handling of an IP, you've got to look at it as a win, I think. Oh, I, I think so. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, we were all very impressed like from that technical aspect of capturing the look and feel of the games um giving that that mature somber tone that you expected from the mm. games uh i i think that aspect of it they they really nailed and i think probably episode three was an example of hey you know there's ways you can deviate from the narrative of the games and still produce a good end product you know it's something that's emotionally satisfying and uh, and tells a really good story you know they like you say they extrapolated from it a little bit and yeah you know it meant changing things a little around a little bit so that certain characters weren't around anymore when joel and ellie show up but uh, i think ultimately you got a pretty satisfying story out of that um out of that episode so 
yeah, I, I very much came down on the side of really enjoying it. I think that was the most um, like emotionally invested I was in the show um, out of all three episodes so far. Um, more more so even than episode one, which really surprised me. But I think it's it comes down to that combination of the writing, the acting's really good. Um, yeah, it's it's. A, I was more emotionally invested in the first episode just because uh, anytime there's a father daughter dynamic, uh, yeah. you know, obviously yeah. you know, connects with me. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if 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 all if if all of uh, Hollywood would at least <clears throat> put some level of care into their agenda driven stories like this one did, uh, I think it'd be a much better uh, level level of cre- of content out there. Uh, this was just an outlier uh, for a lot of the things well, yeah, I've so seen, but it was still good. Something I've seen people discuss is like they what do they do in total? It's like they they do a lot of experience stuff, right? Like um, farming the respective foods or planting, painting, eating, drinking, music, talking about like making the place look a particular way. What they're not doing is talking about in this bizarre era way, like talking about like oppression or pride or anything. It's it's just two guys who have two humans who have a relationship, which I think helped it go over a lot better with a lot of people compared to a lot of stuff that can come out these days where it's like um, a lot of people try to go as far as saying representation blah blah, blah but, but like preaching versus presenting for lack mm. of a better term. I think that's a good way of looking at it yeah because um, they essentially live outside a world where any of those things are even concerns now you know when yep. they're in isolation like that and uh, it was interesting well, we, how we they little, tried oh sorry. Just a real quick I was going to say if they did talk about how like man Sucks being gay in a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> It'd be like, what? <laughs> yeah. But, but they don't go to India, stuff like that. Well, the, the, the fact that these two uh, individuals were trying to preserve and hold on to civilization. You know, they had created this oasis of civilization, and it really served to show, graphically show, what, what is being lost. I mean, the fact that it looked like Mayberry RFD there, where these bucolic suburban homes that were beautiful... And w- when the two of those gentlemen are gone, that's like the last vestiges of civilization. Yeah, it's that's the end. And and when I saw that last shot looking out that window, you know, it, the the episode began with 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 Nick Offerman's character, you know, uh, before he found Frank, looking at the world in black and white through his monitors in a basement. Yeah, and it left off with at the end of his life, the window was open into the the colors of the community that they had created, that was it. That was the end of civilization. So I think that it really served not just to serve, to tell a story of those two characters, and it, it gave you an overall feeling of what has been lost for all of humanity. Yeah, I, I, think that, that, I, that, I think that captures that, I guess, that pathos of, like you say, the end of the, the civilized person, you know, the, the end of the, that old way of thinking yeah. that uh, you can... You can still, um, you know, have an element of trust in other people. You can still cling to the old ways of, of sitting down to have a, a civilized dinner and all that stuff. It's that's it gone now, and this world that they've lost isn't coming back. And the, and to see the change in Bill. I mean, Bill went from a guy living in his basement, being paranoid, to a person that learned how to live. And he said, "My purpose was to save someone else." And yep. that was actually an up in the face of apocalypse. That was kind of an uplifting message is, is how it reflects on joel and ali right his final message to him is like i see a lot of myself in you i respect you I'd, he says like i don't like you but obviously he did and he was like we protect the ones we love i protected him you're gonna protect tess and i thought ah oh, that hits fucking hard doesn't it because uh, joel's just gonna think he failed tess sort of thing failed sarah and so he cannot fail ellie and i think that's going to set up a lot going forward probably well i mean what i'm hoping this does for joel is that it sets up him with an actual purpose now you know and something that he actually approaches with uh with real determination because it feels like he's been kind of just drifting on the tides of wherever the the story's taken him so far mm. and yeah he needs to like take charge a little bit now well, unfortunately, he has a purpose, and they confirmed that it's all all roads are leading to that purpose in season two. I know. Apparently. So, well, uh, I guess this is <laughs> this is the thing that we we talk about, isn't it? It's like we want it to stick to the games until we don't, uh, <laughs> you know, and then we want it to deviate wildly from the games yeah. because I we know what's coming. Much prefer I mean, it deviate, yeah. I'm personally, I'm really hoping that they stay true to the story because it will be very good for my channel. Um, because uh, the Dude, last Jerry, of us part two, like. 
it'll just be like a crazy deja vu. We'll be going through the whole era again. Yes, so like yes. Running through all the arguments again, which yes. to remind everybody of how much of a horrible decision it was in the second game. Yeah, it, it's yeah. it's going to be interesting though whether Neil Druckmann takes a different approach, and you know recognizes like that game was really divisive. Maybe there's an, another way I can accomplish the same aim, but do it in I don't know a more satisfying way for the audience. I don't I mean, think he will, but. I'll take full advantage of it if he switches it too, because I'm like, I, we were right all along. The fans were right, and he changed it. So I mean, I win-win for me. So. If um, well, we can't lose because we'll get Fat Geralt if they. Uh, adapt the <laughs> that's that's true. That's very, truly a misunderstood hero. Uh, He's his own spin-off show. Come on. Yeah, but no, it is interesting. I guess the reactions to this episode, but then yeah, we're only a third of the way through the season now, so it does make me wonder. Yeah. Uh, is it going to deviate more in other places, or is it going to get back on track? You know, we're obviously going to find out on on Monday night, I guess. But um... yeah, because I'm with you on um, <clears throat> Joel and Ellie's relationship. I prefer it in the game so far. Out of the three episodes we've had, I don't think this one is um, as strong. And part of what I'm hoping they'll do is that when something gets very serious, say for example, when they're in the car and uh, there's that trap that's set for them in the game and Joel sees it coming a mile away, and it's to do with the history that he's had. He's probably laid traps like that for people in his life. Mm -hmm. I want that to come up. I'd like it to be that the second they're in the kind of trouble with bandits-type people that are attacking them, Ellie has no say anymore. She does everything he says to a T immediately. There's no more like banter and moments like that. That's the kind of stuff I'd like to see, and then I want it to be broken down over time, you know? Like, um, like the game did. <laughs> It'd be cool if the show does it as well. I think... Uh... Yeah, because they had the exact same conversation in the show at the end of episode three as they had in the game, where it's like, I'm, I'm going to get you to this destination, but you yeah. have to do exactly as I say. It just, I don't know, it didn't it didn't get delivered with the same conviction that it did in the game. And I wonder if this version of Ellie is going to be less cooperative, I guess. Um, or this, this version of Joel is going to be a bit less assertive, because they've already started to deviate from him the original in terms of his personality and stuff he seems like a much more damaged man uh, a less stable man than he was in the games and he's a little I bit warmer too like he's he's more willing to be stepped on so to speak a little bit in conversation <sighs> Uh, I, I think so, yeah. Like the best I could liken it to is like when they're talking to each other. I kind of feel like Ellie's the one who who dictates the the tone and the the sort of pacing of the conversation. You know, she speaks when she's ready, and she asks him questions, and he answers them. And it's like it very much feels like she's in charge of the conversation. Whereas, like, I'd like to see a bit more of a back and forth dynamic. Yeah, you know, he, he's not he's not the he's not the the straight up alpha male from the game. He's just not. Uh, I mean, he's ne definitely a lot more passive, and which bothers me and a lot of people, I'm sure. But I think overall, I mean, I, regardless of my personal opinion on how I feel that the series is going, I, I think that it's being very well received across the board up to this point. I think three was very divided, but episode one and two, um, I personally don't like. I, I I can look at things in two different ways. I can look at it and say, okay, this is a really well-made episode. I just don't like it, or vice versa. But I don't feel emotionally invested in any of this. Now, maybe it's just because of my history with Naughty Dog and how much I don't like them. Um, I, don't, I don't feel that this series is going to go in a good direction. So while I can admit that these things are good, I still think that it's going to end up in a really bad place when it's all said and done. And that's not even talking about Season 2. I'm just thinking towards the end of Season 1. I just don't have confidence in them uh and i think the actress that plays ellie is pretty terrible it was something I, I picked up on with the actress and i don't know whether it's like the script's telling her that she has to act this this way um but what i get is just a pretty limited range where it kind of feels like she can do angry and defiant and she can do like joking around like haha I, you know it's all very funny and i'm making fun of you but like there's not really any depth to that like the Ellie from the the games had real moments of of trauma and um sadness at the things she was witnessing because she was kind of venturing out into the world for the first time and so mm -hmm. you know she had a kind of innocence to her as well that, as well yeah which I think is really important to make a compelling character if you you don't have that balance then you just get someone who's a bit walled off and inaccessible for the audience and it kind of feels like that's what they've got so far and you know like i say we're three episodes in and we're still not 
we're still not like getting let into who Ellie is, and I just wonder how long they're going to take to do that, and whether they might lose their opportunity. It, 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 five it, out of, it, four out of nine is what we're on next, isn't it? It's like mm-hmm. might want to speed it up now, guys. We can't can't be dilly dally. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like the actress plays Ellie as how she knows that Ellie will dominate the story moving forward. Like she 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 treats it with a, some level of uh, overconfidence and over sarcasm at times, and it's like you're treating it the character like you know the character's journey already instead of the character going on the journey if that makes sense does that make sense i think i think i I can see that like the she's she's almost like post arc alley she's not pre-arc alley Mm -hmm. well Uh, i think they they told her specific test she has the answers to the test already and she's she's showing you i I think they told her specifically not to play the game Mm -hmm. they they told her to stay away from that which Which is is... such nonsense It but just no, seems like a she, strange choice. Didn't she watch a playthrough, though? That's what she said? I mean, she did, she but did she wasn't watch, supposed to. It was against so. the, it's almost like how James Gunn told uh, the people on uh, some of his projects not to you know, do any research on some of the, the comics. And that. It, just, it makes no sense. In the history whatsoever. of everything, when has that ever damaged a performance, though? I, I know. Provably speaking, has anyone ever said, I wish I hadn't read the bloody source. I would have been way better. Like, yeah. Uh, but I also think that there's a realism they're bringing into this in the sense that if you grew up in that zone and you lived and you were born into a post-fungal apocalypse environment, you would be you would certainly have to have a hard edge surviving in that world. It would not be it would be difficult to be a sweet person the way Ellie comes off in the game, at least at first. I, I think in the game, like she's not I didn't take her as being like kind of, you know, all sweetness and light and naive. It's more like she puts up this front of being, you know, aggressive and defiant, but beneath it, she kind of hasn't, she hasn't seen much of the world. And although she's lived in this, you know, crappy quarantine zone for for her whole life, um, as as tough as life is there, it's still a relatively sheltered life comparatively to, to other people. Um, and I always took her arc as being like, well, once she gets outside those walls, she gets to see a bit of the world. She gets to experience, you know, the real danger of like other humans and so on, um, you know, and learns to stand on her own two feet because of the things that Joel teaches her. And like at times she's forced to stand up and defend him because he's injured and, you know, he needs her help. Um, that was her arc. It was learning self-reliance and learning self-confidence, um, and not quite losing that that edge of compassion that she had, you know, um, and teaching that to Joel. Like I always took it as like a, a kind of balancing out of each other's personalities. Like she teaches him to be a bit more compassionate and and, and soften up in some ways, and he teaches her to toughen up in other ways, and they they level out with each other. Uh, yeah, and I feel like in the game at this point, at least, there was more evidence that she was respecting. Uh, what Joel represented, which was he's basically my bodyguard, and that as much as I can toy around with him a little bit, uh, he's what he says goes, which is why I'm like curious to see what'll happen now that he's set that rule in episode three. I, I hope we can see sort of the results of that. Um, or are we gonna jump ahead now? Because this is the thing I, I worry about the timeline. We got to do the cannibals, obviously, the, the two guys they meet up with, and uh, the bandits portion, obviously, Tommy, which I think they're gonna have a bigger focus on Tommy in this show possibly so don't know how everything's going to spread out but we'll see i suppose yeah um it's certainly beautifully made yeah well i, looks, I absolutely love great. the world building through the uh the production and if they've got they have to have green screens going because i know they didn't film in a ruined city uh so some of those shots i'm like damn dude they look great like uh and there's nothing but praise for a lot of the sets you can tell it takes insane work and sometimes they'll film in the set for like a three minute scene and then we never see it again. It's like that's that's excellent. Good job, guys. You know. I, the I lobby love the little... hotel too, with the water and the, the Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um I love as well like the, the bits that flesh out the backstory to this, you know, where you get like uh, little snippets from during the, the outbreak, how it how it took hold, what people tried to do to stop it, uh the military getting involved, all that stuff. Like it fleshes out things that you didn't necessarily see in the games and yeah, I really enjoy that stuff. I love seeing how it went down, you know. Absolutely. It's all great world building. Um 
Well, I, I, quite, um, I quite like that line where he was like, "You're a, you think 9/11 was an inside job? You think the government of Nazis?" He goes, "The government are." Yeah. Nazis. He's like not then. <laughs> yeah, they, they weren't originally. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's good stuff. Um, but yeah, Rob, I want I really want to ask you about Star Trek Picard season three. But uh, one, what I might suggest we cover a little bit first is uh, the launch of the new DC. Uh, the DCU mm. under James oh, Gunn boy. because, uh, well, he's made his big announcement and he's announced all the projects that he's got coming up. And I don't know, man, it seemed to be greeted with a, a pretty muted reception, um, as best I can tell. And I'm putting that fairly diplomatically. But I think when I saw that video and I watched it with, with Mauer and um, Az and Gary on Real BBC, um, it was just project after project where we were like, Okay, Where, where's where's the good stuff? Um, and just to put it into some kind of context here, the the things that I think he led with were Creature Commandos, uh, Waller, the TV show, uh, Lanterns, uh, and Paradise Lost, um, which you know, uh, a lot of these, particularly Creature Commandos, it's um, it seems to be right in James Gunn's wheelhouse where. He's basically, uh, you know, we're going to take another team of misfits and throw them together on some wacky adventures. And I don't know, man. It's probably not how I would launch a, a, a new version of the DCU if I was him, because um, you're you're following in some pretty big footsteps. So I I ended up in a call, uh, I think a day after that real busy thing, and I was going to talk with Freaking Rags about this, and I was just like, you know, what? I want to test something because Rags didn't hear anything about it. And I was like, Rags, uh, are you excited for this upcoming slate? I already knew he didn't know anything about it. He was like, no, no, what, what, what is it? And I was like, all right, the authority. And I just let it sit, right? And he was just like, what, what, is that a group of people, that heroes, I guess? And I was like, yep, excited? And he was like, sure. And then I was like, yeah, uh, all right, sweet, boost of gold? How about that? And he was like, don't know what that is. And I was like, yep, no, I know. Uh, well, how about, you know, Paradise Lost, eh? And he was like, is that... What is that? And I was like, a Themyscira? It's kind of like a Westerosi show. That's the idea. And he was just like, what? And then I was like, all right, Creature Commandos. Come on. And, you know, and he, he was just like, are you fucking with me? And I was like, okay, so the, the, the real ones, there is a Superman. There is a Green Lantern. There is a Batman. But how do you feel about, like, I was like, Swamp Thing. And, and, you know, I think all of these things can be good. They absolutely can. But, like, from a business perspective, what are you doing? I don't understand. This seems like a misstep. It's. It, we talked about a lot about this on Tuesday night's main event with uh, with Ripa and, and Ryan, but it, it's James Gunn has just started out completely wrong. And I know like this will be a sports analogy, so maybe a lot of people won't get it. But it's like James Gunn basically walked in as like Phil Jackson with the Chicago Bulls and fired Michael Jordan when he got rid of Henry Cavill. You you had Henry Cavill. I am not a fan of Snyder's DCEU. I hate Snyder's DCEU. I can't stand it. I'm glad he's gone, and I hope they put a restraining order on Snyder to make sure he can't come within 100 miles of a DC property ever again. I hate these movies. But Henry Cavill is perfect for the role of Superman. He's perfect, and, and you need to work around whatever it takes from a creative standpoint and a budget standpoint to get Henry Cavill back and make a legitimately good Superman movie. You start with Superman and everything else – can then follow, make that the Iron Man. If you guys want to copy the MCU constantly, then just make a good Superman movie. But I feel he's starting out in a, in a bad place because he's already put a really negative tone with the Henry Cavill thing out there. And that was after an announcement that Henry Cavill made publicly after he was in the the, the movie with The Rock, which I didn't even go see, um, Black Adam. So I, I it just makes no sense. So he's starting out on the wrong foot. Then this big announcement, this big announcement, and I feel that this was such a nothing announcement. There was nothing to get people excited. So I don't even know why it happened, but it, it feels like this is just – he doesn't feel like the right guy for it. And I say that as someone that loves Guardians 1 and 2 and the Christmas special, uh, and I liked Brightburn a lot. I just don't feel like he's the guy that can be the creative force behind an entire universe up to this point. I, I just think he's I'm gonna be honest. I've said this said this on Tuesday night main main event. <clears throat> James Gunn to me is the most overrated, overhyped director, producer that I I can really think of in the comic book space, even compared to Taika Watiti. I'm on Damn. the complete opposite end, uh where where Jeremy is on 
Guardians 1 and Guardians 2. Mm -hmm. I think that those those movies work for for I guess what his I guess his vision per se is because what he does is he takes a skate did it with Peacemaker. It's the same formula where he takes characters that people will know of that maybe are followers of comic book stuff. But as far as trying to make that translate into like some decent like um, film or, or sh show, he, he does not have that in him. He still hasn't proven that. Those characters are just those characters in name. Peacemaker is just Peacemaker in name. And this is why I think he's the absolute worst guy to try to get to do something like this because now he's going to be forced to try to facilitate something based on characters that will a lot more people normies are going to care more about be it batman uh in, in the bad family superman all of that sort of stuff he has not proven that he can even do anything remotely like that so when i remember when it first got announced that he was gonna basically be the brains of the operation i was like I, I, that was a weird uh choice and it, it's even more so proven that he he doesn't seem capable of really even trying to do decent adaptations of these characters because to Mamala's point, when you, you you look at that slate, it's a bunch of characters that is going to be similar to Guardians. It's going to be similar to Suicide Squad, where it's like these are characters that only myself, the nerd, right, will have have read this stuff. We know, you know, Wildstorms uh, uh, stuff and all that. We may know of these characters; other people won't, so we can just kind of treat it as a free for all. And even the stuff with the notable characters doesn't seem like it's going to be on brand. What the hell is a true detective version of? of the of john stewart and and how jordan that doesn't seem at all appealing at least not to not to me and then to reference like with the supergirl stuff one of the to me the worst writers uh worst um like everything wrong with modern comics and tom king they skipping all that source material to reference his work which just happened last last year you know what i mean and and i just don't understand kind of the direction so the titles in themselves aren't really interesting i guess you got brave and bold i guess that can see him more of the uh like bat family stuff uh i i doesn't really make sense that you're going though with a young kind of superman uh it seems to be but with batman if you're going to be starting with like damien uh, if, if he's going to kind of be there and as a robin or something of that nature then you're talking about a very established batman so those are yeah. two kind of antithetical uh concepts with or at least point in times in their careers with with batman and superman which are your flagship sort of characters so i i didn't go as far as to say if it was dead uh on arrival but i'm like right there man i i just i don't know how he's going to salvage it um at all plus they're all in on the multiversal stuff it seems like huh. it so i i don't know one thing I find interesting about this is uh, I think this would have been a better announcement had we removed six of these from the announcement. <laughs> get, get rid of Waller, Creature Commandos, Paradise Lost, keep Lanterns, keep Batman, keep Superman. If you announce the three of those, and Supergirl maybe, um, that seems so much more focused. And you say, like, this is the foundation, we're starting with these. And then maybe, maybe a week later, say, like, oh, by the way, you know, of course, we got some other stuff coming out as sort of, like, supplemental material to fill in the universe. I think that would go over way better. Having this all at once, I can't believe it. I, what, a, what a silly choice. It's so distracting. Because I think uh, River's absolutely right, by the way. He picked these on purpose. He picked the authority and uh, the creature commanders because he can do whatever he wants with them. Uh, nobody's really going to complain except the hardcore fans, right? And that's, well, I, I think much. in his announcement, there was a lot of mention of, like, this is a real passion project of mine. And I just thought, is that what this is? Is it yeah. just, like, you indulging your own creative impulses and just doing what you personally want to do rather than mm -hmm. what's actually best for the, the franchise? Uh, is that how they lured you in? I don't know. I think there might be a a, a larger purpose at work that we at least the way I, I sort of see it with creature commandos and the authority if they already exist in this world there's sort of a call it a not necessarily a moral compass you know if you have these monsters fighting in world war ii and then the authority is what we have that are superheroes until the rise of say call it the justice league that our world is sort of descending into call it a certain kind of a madness and it's the rise of the characters that we know i mean i could see he's sort of doing a reverse kingdom come with the authority and that he's pitting them to be 
the villains call it the 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 crime syndicate from Earth Three. They're kind of a ready-made mirror of the Justice League. That it gives the Justice League a great foil if they're leading up to that. And I think it's kind of interesting. Whereas if you look at how they're approaching the holistic universe, in terms of like they have to, the difference is they have to make a universe itself that works. And they're approaching it like you've got Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, coming at it from very different perspectives from all of those principal foundational characters of the DC universe. But they're doing it in different ways. But they're all like like I was thinking. They they said the lantern. It's like True Detective. It's a cop story. What if what if they're on the trail of the anti life equation or something, and nobody knows what that is yet. And and there's larger mystical works at play with Swamp Thing, and we're we're going to see the rise of all of this this stuff. And uh, I think they've because it is called instead of Phase One, Gods and Monsters, and that that interested me to see there there seems to be a purpose behind all this. You know, James Gunn wrote a novel. A lot of people don't know this, but he wrote a novel called The Toy Collector that's very dark. And it's certainly not like Guardians of the Galaxy, and it's not like Slither or Super or anything that he's ever done. And he does come out of trauma in the 90s. He worked yeah. for Lloyd Kaufman, and uh, which they made a lot of really interesting films, not just the Toxic Avenger. But um, so I do think that there's and he's worked with Peter Safran for over 20 years and they are going to bring in other people to make these movies like whether James Mangold makes Swamp Thing or whether Ben Affleck does the Batman. And I hope they adapt his Batman Deathstroke the Terminator script because, man, I wanted to see that made. So I think it's going to be kind of an interesting direction. And I think they're only going to get A-list creators under this interesting umbrella. So. I mean, they had to lead with Superman, but where they're going to wind up, I think, is going to be quite, quite interesting to see how it develops. But see, I, I would never uh, bring you down for having hope, but your pitch there is way better than the video I watched. <laughs> <laughs> well, and maybe I'm reading more into it. You know, I, I, but I think if you were correct, I'd be like, in retrospect, I'll just be like, wow, what a mistake of how you sold this because. He so quickly mentions them all. I think in his video, does he even mention Wonder Woman or Diana when he talks about uh, Paradise Lost? Scary thing. I don't think so. No. That's insane. No. What are you doing? Like, I, w- I would almost be like, dude, you've got to mention her. Like, it's Wonder Woman. What are you yeah, doing? but I mean, like, I, I just wish it wasn't all this universe building stuff with, with the way that comic book movies are right now. Like, what did Top Gun Maverick just show us? That if you take something that people are familiar with, and you just give it a simple, like Batman and Superman don't need groundbreaking movies. They just need a simple story that honors them with good performances to kind of start, you know, building their individual movies or whatever. Like people are not looking for anything groundbreaking. They just wanted you to get back to basics. And Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, these are American icons that everyone knows. So you, you, you're already well ahead of the game with the marketing. But there's this... They're over. I feel it's just an overreach to just continue to go. We're starting out with this universe, and it's all going to be connected. And it's like just make a good movie with with an iconic character, and then after you've established that, then you can work on, you know, the the rest of the effects that you want to take from that. I just I'm tired of the universe stuff and the overarching thing. <clears throat> we're going to build all of this to connect to that, and it's like, no, just make a good movie, and you it's have the, the pieces. It's the money, though. It's always the money because. I know. You, where else except in something like the MCU could a character like Ant Man make like half a billion dollars? That that's the thing. Like because it was part of that larger MCU, that's why people went to see it. Because there's always that implication with every single one of these movies, no matter how obscure the oh, character. Yeah, you're you're gonna have to go and see it because yeah. there'll be some little tantalizing hint about where the the you know the Infinity Saga is going or whatever. And it gets people involved. If it's just a bunch of like disconnected movies in their own universes, uh, people won't see it. And it's you know, like you say, from a purely creative point of view, I'd much rather they just focused on making the best movies they could individually. Mm-hmm. But from a business point of view, I, I totally see why they they try to do and, it. And I probably yeah. have asked this question on some of the panels I'm on, but I. It, has we confirmed that Gal Gadot's not coming back as Wonder Woman? Has that been confirmed? Well, we well the, see here in the Flash movie, right? 
Well, James Gunn said as well that he's the door is open apparently for all of them to come back potentially apart from Henry Cavill, the one that everyone actually <laughs> oh, wanted. No, it makes no yeah. sense. It makes no <laughs> sense. It's I don't so get it. Weird. I think something else must have happened because that yeah, it just doesn't really make sense. I mean, there's a quote from him here, like you know, he was getting interviewed by the BBC, I think, about this, and so he said, uh, "Yeah, okay, this is." Um, we didn't fire Henry, Gunn told journalists. Henry was never cast. For me, it's about who do I want to cast as Superman and who do the filmmakers we have want to cast. Well, yeah, obviously. Uh, and for me, for this story, it isn't Henry. Uh, I like Henry. I think he's a great guy. I think he's getting <laughs> messed around by a lot of people, including the former regime at this company. But this Superman is not Henry for a number of reasons, which I'm not going to tell you. Um, that sounds like they just... They didn't fire him. They just they fixed the glitch, uh, it, you know, from Office Space. That's what, what they did. They just they, they fired him. They fired him by not rehiring him, by not re-upping his contract. It's obvious that there's something deeper going what do you guys on. Think if they had made him Jor El, <laughs> I, I just I just want him to be I, Superman. I, I just, yeah, <laughs> that's I what know. I want. I, I know, I, but if they truly, honestly, and authentically believe. He won't. He needs to be younger to play the character that we're trying to build with this Superman. Would you accept that as a caveat that they no, at least no? It'd be him? a distraction. I think that'd be a distraction. Uh, I, I think that would uh, that would be probably even that would be a bigger negative than positive. I think that's what I think. Because I mean, I truly believe that. I do believe that they want to move away from the Snyder verse just because of. Uh, the, the fan base is so uh, loud, and, and I, I have nothing but respect for the Snyder fans. I've said that a thousand times. I, I don't like the movies, but I appreciate that the fan base is so passionate, and fans need to be passionate. They need to be passionate and vocal and stand by what they want, but it's just that they are – they there's such a an aura around that, and I feel like maybe that's one reason why they're moving away from Cavill because he is the face of the Snyder universe outside of Zack himself. It could be. I think if they if they had like basically unlimited resources, they could have done all of the Snyderverse as like an Elseworlds um, pfft, like franchise that sits outside Gunn's version of the DCU. So you could almost have two franchises running parallel well, to each other or something. Doing that. I mean, that's why it's kind of <clears> stupid <throat> because they're doing that with like they're saying that basically the Batman and whatever I guess yeah. is upcoming Ta-Nehisi Coates uh, Superman is going to be. <laughs> Uh, and, and it's Elseworlds, so they're still do doing that that whole idea. But I don't know. I, I even push back on the, some of the creative stuff because it isn't like Christina Hodgson, like, ain't she part of that? Like, uh, wasn't she confirmed as far as one of the writers that's going to be a part of these projects? She's the one that got to Birds of Prey as well as this canceled. I think she wrote that canceled Bad Girl um, stuff, and really? apparently she, she's on really? board. If I'm not mistaken, uh, Christina Hotson. and so if she's on board with um, with any of this, I don't, I don't, I think I push back on the idea that even the creatives are going to that are going to be a part of this know what the hell that they're doing because it does seem like. Well, let me say this: now we know why, like the whole Flash situation, why they absolutely refuse to kind of cancel that because they're using that as a segue into this whole yeah. uh, new universe, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're going to utilize the character and uh, it's probably going to be some him running around, changing timelines and stuff. And that's going to launch the new the new DC stuff. Uh, so they are grabbing some of the uh, and even like with the initial launch, I think they're uh, like Blue Beetle and Aquaman are going to be technically the first movies in this new timeline. Right. So th they're still pulling from the Snyderverse or pulling from from that uh, in, in some way it's just a thing that people actually really wanted Wait, maybe some reason. i'm honestly waiting for the announcement like as soon as all those movies are out the gate and they're done with their theatrical runs like they'll just be like yeah so we're not moving forward with uh with, she, yeah. you know aquaman or with the current wonder woman or the current flash like they're all Shazam, getting rebooted right? as well as yeah it's like they, they have to they have to maintain the facade that they're still viable until the movies are done finishes the theatrical run they'll announce like we're we're sunsetting shazam he's 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 going now. He might be back in some form in some way, but this one he's he's going. Bye bye. That was great because but the Flash, Aquaman, and everything they they're going strong. And as soon as they're all dead, be like, all right, they're going now. That was great. That was. Fun. They they all have that feel of like the New Mutants, like that final X Men movie that no one 
cared about because it came out like five years after it was made (laughs) and like to be reasonable there is no sense in not promoting them you want them to make as much money as possible so of course that's like my favorite part of the video by the way when james gunn is like the flash i i love it it's gonna be great (laughs) it's like okay man yeah you love it Uh, yeah i mean that does is anybody worried that, that we're gonna get timothy chalamet as superman (laughs) <laughs> and I say that as somebody that loved Dune. I, I Dune is one of my favorite theatrical experiences. It's I loved it, but I wouldn't. And... <laughs> I wouldn't put it past James Gunn to do something completely and... left field like well, that. Paul Atreides doesn't scream Superman to you, really. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be him, and and I, I liked Robert Pattinson as Batman. I liked the Batman, um, but I <sighs> those two guys being like Superman and Batman. Good lord, man. <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, but to be fair, we're getting a second Batman, right? Which I think is quite a thing to juggle, having two Batmans in watch. Which is funny, because we get another two Batmans, or three Batmans in the Flash movie, I right? think, yeah, I think there's about six of them in total, like, <laughs> active at the Batman moment. Jeez, man. <laughs> and you know, you know, from their perspective, they're just like, which one makes the most dollars? we got to find him. <laughs> That's the one yeah. we need. Yeah. Because, like, you know, the Reeves uh, Batman, if it doesn't, like... There's going to be a certain threshold. If it doesn't make it on the second one, they're probably going to scuttle all of that off as well. Be like, all right, Reeves, you had your yeah. chance. You're off. Because that, that had a pretty troubled production as well, didn't it? So like, they maybe don't want that kind of hassle if it's not going to make crazy money. And it didn't. I mean, I don't know what the bot. I think the it made like seven 700. For, I don't think it hit 800 yeah. million worldwide. No, so, it I didn't. mean, that's not a huge number. It's not, it's, it did lose money, but we're in the. I don't think we're in the golden age of comic book movies anymore. I think that, you know, post uh, Endgame is kind of where that kind of started to decline. But we're still in a a very healthy era for that, even post COVID and all of that. And the Batman, I mean, I just, I don't think it does. It feels off the Doctor Strange beat out the Batman, right? It's like, wait, what? And that was a bad movie. That was a really (laughs) bad movie. Um but yeah, it, so, it, it, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I so I'm glad they have confidence in, in it moving forward. But um, I don't feel that there's momentum. I don't feel like people are just sitting around waiting for the Batman Part Two. Yeah, I don't feel like there's no. this huge kind of desire for the second version. Of that even though I think it was well received, it just didn't it didn't well, do anything. Th- that's what I think is missing with the whole industry. You know what I mean? If if the comic book stuff is going to continue to be a thing it doesn't even matter the genre whether it's superhero stuff or or whatever stuff that they're pulling like it, it's the the lack of enthusiasm um i think is what it's well let me say that it's missing that like where people are just at least stoked to go see a, a follow-up film be it a sequel or whatever it is a, a a movie that's in this this universe and it seems like now a lot of this stuff is uh, like a chore right people are watching these just for the sake of watching them as opposed to actually being stoked um and i think it's less of the fatigue of the of the genre and more that again they're not really giving you and like come on like dc we, they set this whole thing up right they said that this is supposed to uh, we're finally gonna know and then they launch with that like i don't know who the hell is on a marketing team even if we can like you know what robert did which is a good job trying to try to at least see maybe the silver <laughs> lining of it all it's still like not anything like you supposed to come out swinging like all right we're launching this bad boy here's going to be batman we're going to have superman wonder woman lanterns we're going to put we're giving you both the best of both worlds uh, you some people like john they like how jordan uh whatever you're supposed to come out swinging and that's the opposite of what they did it was like very mundane and he himself doesn't even it doesn't i don't get the feeling that he's like enthusiastic to work about uh, to work on this stuff, and I think that's just what it, what it's missing. This whole kind of genre of the comic book space, Marvel is even having difficulties trying to garner up like actual enthusiasm um, for for their projects. Do you I think, think yeah. uh, in reality, like they don't have half as many ideas as they're making out? But like we had to put some kind of announcement out, and it's like, oh yeah, we've got all so. these I movies coming up. They're going to be yeah. great. I Trust think me. that was a, a big part of it. It was like, look, man, we got to give them something. So let's just let's just try to figure it out. But I don't think that they got the answers like that. I, I just don't see. Uh, I don't, and I don't know who, why they went with James Gunn. I still can't really quite understand that as the brains if you are just trying to get people uh stoked let's say uh on this and obviously you want them to be able to perform and do a good job in, in building the world per se but it, it's just it was 
that was a dead kind of mundane kind of launch like hey this is what's to come and you look at that you see the lineup and you're like i guess you know and i shouldn't have to be like that well i'm like i, I guess i can see whoa yeah we're getting john stewart and, and Hal jordan i guess i can see where that but that it shouldn't be like that it's like oh i'm supposed to be stoked we're, we're finally going to get this in a live action setting it's the complete opposite of that was, well, you know, I think the the thing about the the John Stewart, Hal Jordan, Green Lantern, the first thing that made it, I thought of was the Neil Jordan, Neil Jordan. He's a British director. The, <laughs> the, 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 the Neil Adams, uh, Denny O'Neill, uh, Green Lantern, Green Arrow stories from the 70s that's been mm-hmm. collected into an absolute edition. There's that famous cover where they walk in on Speedy who's shooting up, he's shooting up heroin. And the cover said, "My ward Speedy is a junkie," you know. And it was it was Green Lantern and Green Arrow going out to discover the heart of America, and it was a very different kind of a superhero story. And again, this is the '70s, so not a lot of people remember it, but it has been collected in many different uh, formats. And I, I suggest everybody read it because there's some great stories in there. And that was the first thing that that this announcement of John Stewart and John and how Jordan doing something true detective style because they're both John Stewart's Marines and and how Jordan's a test pilot he's Air Force and to see these two military guys I was wondering like are they green lanterns that have yet to reveal themselves to the world or are they military investigators that are going to be come green lanterns together I was very intrigued by that idea and the fact that they're putting the two of them together it, it 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 made a lot of I had a lot of questions that I immediately kind of got excited about. Again, wondering that's an interesting way to go about doing this show. And the first thing that I thought about was, you know, one of the great comic runs of the seventies that I always loved, which was the Green Lantern. I remember buying those reprints back when I first started collecting comics again in the eighties. And that's intriguing to me. So it it, it, it it's it might not be something to get initially like, oh, my God, I'm so excited. But there's something interesting about it that was it it, it was not expected. And I'm curious to see where they're going to go with it and who is the creative team who's going to do this. And I think yeah. they already have a creative team in mind that they didn't announce. I think for all of those. I mean, I know they, yeah. they might say that they, they don't uh, – they're looking maybe for talent or whatever. But I think for all of those, they have – I guess, and that's part of it, right? That's going to be very telling of the direction that they're they're going. I mean, some of it I, I don't really understand. Like I said, of all people to to reference, Tom King's Supergirl or Tom King anything for that matter was a bizarre choice, especially with a character um, uh, uh, with a character like that. I, obviously, the, the Brave and the Bold. I think from a just pure storyline uh, standpoint, you're going to have some people that are more intrigued by that. And yeah, I'm all about kind of entertaining what uh the the other side of of the bat family and i would rather see you know todd as as red hood uh grayson as nightwing as opposed to robin and tim drake as red robin i think all of that stuff is is something to get behind i don't know exactly if they're even going to do that but i I think it's something that can get people supportive of it but i think the the just the whole angle of the this is our slate was just a weird choice like that's something that seems like something that you don't put a lot of hey here's going to be our big announcement it's more of like this is what we're kind of working on type of situation i think um just the approach of the marketing i I don't really understand because like i said i'm not i'm walking away from this like okay like i guess you know trying to figure out what what there is that's in 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 this whole slate that i can be excited about as opposed to just it being that commanding like for your first it's james gunn you know they made a big deal you're supposed to be the kevin feige of dc uh let's see what 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 you got and he's like yeah this is what i'm working on i'm like okay so i i just did i don't understand the angle um and I, i'm willing to bet those guys think they're smarter than everybody here so we'll, we'll see what happens part of um something that i found interesting right is about james gunn trying to figure him out as a creative based on as uh, rob was mentioning earlier right i remember watching super for the first time being like wow okay <laughs> this is a long conventional <laughs> bit um, different what he's invested in like and I, I kind of feel the same as a lot of people do it's just like i don't feel like james gunn's the kind of guy who cares a lot about superman i believe he cares a lot about someone like booster gold i read the description i'm like oh that sounds like a james gunn project 
But the thing about it is, and I was um, I was talking with some friends about this. I was like, where would you put a story described as booster gold in the MCU? And I was like, probably Phase Four. I feel like he might come out um, during all the blip stuff. I could see someone trying to take advantage of all of it and, and maybe likes the allure of the hero. And it was funny because I was thinking about it. I was like, oh, I guess it's kind of what they had going with Mysterio and Far From Home. He was like, I want to be a hero. I want to try and take advantage of it. And that was um, that was post blip stuff, wasn't it? And so I was thinking like launching with it. That's because it's James Gunn, isn't it? Like he's he's pushing up the projects he wants to do. And it's like maybe that's got the benefit of the fact that his passion will be in it but simultaneously. And I've seen a lot of people say this, like, you've got to push that part of your ego down, surely. You need to know that your preferences have to take se second fiddle to, like... 100%. Well, that's that's know, what I was saying it. earlier, yeah. Like, so many of those projects were just described by him as a passion project. And I, I can't help but wonder, is, like, is that how they lured him in? Just by saying, like, you get to indulge all these, like, you know, quirky, weird little characters that you want to do. Um, and, you know, that's how we're going to... That's where we're going to bring you in. And he's like, yeah, sure, okay. I've got a blank check to do whatever I want. But, um, you know, the the other problem is, like, he's he's like the, the guy who's supposed to be overseeing this. He's not going to be there directing all of these films. And so, like, he doesn't even get to indulge himself in that way anyway. He's he's supposed to be higher than that. You know, he's just, uh, he's planning it. He's strategic. Uh, and again... James Gunn's never done anything like that before. He can direct a movie for sure and produce good movies, uh, mostly. But yeah, can you then take can go up to that higher level of suddenly like overseeing a dozen different movies and uh, a huge like interconnected universe? That's a whole different ball game. Well, I'd like to you know he uh, he is working with his longtime friend and collaborator Pierce Safran, and the thing about Peter Safran, they're the co presidents of the DC universe. Now Peter Safran. He is coming from James Wan's universe where they, Warner Brothers, uh, Peter Safran oversaw and produced all of the Conjuring universe mm -hmm. with James Wan. So, and, and James Wan also directed Aquaman. He directed Aquaman, The Lost Kingdom that Peter Safran produced. Peter Safran produced the Shazam films, both of them. But the Conjuring movies, you know, they had The Nun, Annabelle Creation. They had all the, the Conjuring film, the films. The universe. The curse. I mean, it, it, they did that whole, and they were very successful. That that whole Call of Duty universe. I just call it the Conjuring universe, so everybody knows what we're yeah, talking yeah. about. But so Peter Safran has worked at Warner Brothers now for the better part of a decade, overseeing both two hundred million dollar movies and then also lower budget uh, horror films. And he's also, I worked on a film with James Gunn, a, a very low budget movie that actually Craig Mazin directed, uh, called The Specials about the world's seventh or eighth greatest super team, which came out on Blu-ray. It's a very obscure Robert movie. It has a story about everybody. It's incredible. <laughs> it's great. It's insane. But, but yeah, if you, it, 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 it came out, nobody bought the Blu-ray, but uh, uh, La La Land Records released it. And it had a great cast, Thomas Aiden Church and Paget Brewster and Rob Lowe. And James Gunn's actually in the movie playing a character named Minute Man. And he wrote the script and Craig Mazin directed it. I was an associate producer on the movie. But... Um, they, Peter Safran and, and James Gunn were working on, they were working together, this was back in 2000. And um, so they have a really long-standing relationship. So I'm, uh, sorry, my light just went out, but I'm very curious, <laughs> I'm very curious to see what, what they come up with together. Um, and I think they're, James Gunn is more of a creative entity, but Peter Safran is definitely a money guy and a producer guy, and he has a long standing relationship with Warner Brothers. So uh, where James Gunn is relatively new doing Peacemaker and the Suicide Squad, but I think together in tandem, they're gonna do something really interesting. And unlike a lot of other people, they've been taking meetings with people at the studio. They've called in like Ben Affleck and they had that Jason Momoa meeting and they're meeting with people directly and sitting down with these creators. And I think they're hand picking people. So what's really interesting is I think they're going to find, I mean, with James Mangold saying he's interested in doing Swamp Thing, and if you look at Mangold's track record all the way back to Copland, which is one of Stallone's best performances, mm -hmm. and, you know, doing things like, well, the Wolverine, but Logan, and doing 310 to Yuma, and doing Ford v. Ferrari, and even movies he did like Identity, um, even the Tom Cruise movie Night and Day, which is lightweight, but even James Mangold, for him to come in and have 
them bring him in and do Swamp Thing, they're going to have the pick of the litter in terms of... And Ben Affleck has made four movies as a director for Warner Brothers, including Argo, which won Best Picture, even though he didn't even get a directing nomination. So they're sort of... I think they're bringing in a team of people, and they're going to allow those people to make the movies they want to make. And one of the things that James Gunn said, I thought, which I thought was the best thing he said, he said, look, I'm a writer, and we're no longer going to move forward with these projects unless the scripts are rock solid. Because so often these big-budget movies, they literally go into production, and the scripts aren't finished. <clears throat> so that was the one thing that I think Saffron, as a producer, Saffron's going to be like, there's no way we're going to go in on a $200 million movie unless the script is rock solid and gives us the kind of foundation we need. So from a production standpoint, I think what they're going to do, and it'll be interesting to see who they bring in to make all these things. That's going to be the real key, I think. I'm, it, it, honestly, I hope what they get is time to do all this stuff properly, like more than anything, because the, the downfall of the DCEU was playing catch-up with Marvel, trying to rush out movies um, to to get their extended universe up and running uh, in half the time that Marvel did it, uh, and then panicking because like one or two didn't get well received, and then trying to like course correct midway through production, it just led to disaster upon disaster. Uh, I just hope that they get the time to just give it their shot, but do it right. You know, if at least we get to see their creative vision brought to life, um, that'll be something. Because it feels like every other regime that's tried to fix the DCEU has come in for a couple of years. Um, the movies that have come out during that time have been things that were already in the pipeline, and so you didn't really get a, a sense of what they were going to do. Then they get ousted, someone else gets brought in, and yeah, man, I just hope that, that doesn't happen in this case. I hope they at least get a chance to bring their vision into reality, whether it's good mm. or bad, I don't know. I think James, the, James the only Gunn thing that they announced that was... Um, like as far as dates, well, they were well, it was Superman, wasn't it? Like everything uh, else, basically, we don't know. Yes, yeah, they, they, they were real. Yeah, they were really specific about that. Yeah, yeah and the yeah. sequel to the Batman was. Yeah, sequel yeah, to the yeah, Batman. Yeah, Batman. yeah, that that one. So those are really the only two. So you know, to your point, uh, maybe they are going to to take their time, but I, I I just don't know. Some of these obscure, I don't know. Like even the whole Paradise Lost thing, when he, when yeah. he invoked the whole, oh, it's gonna be like games. Game of Thrones, like I was like, why? Um, I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. You know it, 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 Hollywood's a copycat world in a lot of ways. I mean, you remember back like after Dark Knight and Inception, everybody was going for the 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 dark, gritty, you know, kind of Nolan esque thing, and now everybody's moved it to the we got to do a superhero deal. I, I do think James Gunn has an enormously uh, enormous tough task ahead of him. It's it's going to be difficult because the DCEU has been uh, – they have never – I don't think it's ever been maximized. I, I mean, you go back to the Dark Knight trilogy and all that, and I know those did well with Nolan, but I mean, Nolan is, Nolan's hands are all over Man of Steel. So he doesn't get a pass on that, dar that dog shit movie. Um, but um, – <laughs> So it's but it's never been fully realized through all of this. It's always felt weird because you've had so much going on on TV. You've had all these different iterations. How many Jokers have we had? And I mean, obviously, the Joker with Joaquin Phoenix was fantastic, but it was a standalone. No, IP. no, I think I think you mean to say Jared Leto was fantastic. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> no, 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 no. God, that was, and I even continue to forget that James Gunn directed the Suicide Squad. I always forget about that because I always talk about his Guardians movies. Um, but I found the Suicide Squad to be okay. It's it was really fine. Terrible. It was funny. You know, I think it was okay. It didn't make much money, but I don't know if that yeah. was part of the like the yeah. pandemic was still yeah, going on then. So. Yeah, yeah, it, it was fine. But he does. He's got an uphill battle for sure. And, and maybe they can get some some. It's some. Maybe they can get some consistency behind it. It's no coincidence, of course, that we haven't seen any news of, of specifically. I think of, for Wonder Woman or the Flash or Aquaman or Shazam for the new run, because they're still probably figuring out what they're even doing and how well these movies are going to do when they come out. And so, for all we know, we have seen a fraction of the plans, like like huge plans. And I was thinking, like the problem a lot of people highlighted with Snyder's universe was that we hit the ground running. Right, second movie is like the. Uh, Return of the Dark Knight, or whatever, plus Superman's death, plus Justice League, 
It was like you guys have sprinted into the. But like this comes across to me as like more sprinting than ever. Marvel's MCU is like developing and, and producing what, like 35 to 40 characters worth of stuff. It's just everywhere. And so, like, when they played the catch up game in, let's say, 2012, they're like, right, we got to get an Avengers movie as soon as possible. Playing catch up now, it's like, right, we got to get a literal fucking army's worth of projects going. Well, yeah, and like a lot of the things that they're announcing are the kind of uh, lower level, like obscure stuff that you would do in like phase three when you're really well established and you can afford to float things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's just it, like we've said before in this chat, like you just you wouldn't lead with stuff like this. If you're trying to like launch this thing, you want to hit hard with your big your big hitters, Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman. You know, get yeah. those guys out, get them great movies, then build on that. They're your well, foundations. That's, that's what I was talking about recently with Star Wars and how when Andor was something that a, a lot of people seemed to, to really enjoy. I, I saw the first few episodes and I thought it was it was you know fine, but not a lot of people talked about it. And that's because Star Wars has been so damaged by the heavy hitters within the, the universe that mm -hmm. they've done so much damage. And so in a in a perfect world, you you would have had a, a proper sequel trilogy. And then you obviously have things like The Mandalorian and then Clone Wars, which I very much loved. But by the time we get to Andor, if, if you've got all that healthy, people would have watched that. Not as many people, but people would have watched that and they would have enjoyed that different take on it. But you've hurt the universe so bad that you don't have enough people that are actually caring enough about that to talk about it and lift it up. And that's the same kind of thing you're dealing with here with the DC. You've got a lot of these lower level or unknown properties that you're announcing but if you don't take care of batman wonder woman superman mm. nobody's going to be talking about that other stuff oh it just seems like an obvious no-brainer sort of thing and uh, mm -hmm. i remember as well topping this all off i remember saying to rags i was like okay walla and he was like what do you mean like, the walla tv show man like, and he was like what why and then i was like okay wait let me pitch it to you it's a spin-off of a spin-off of a movie that was a sequel to another film that it wanted to basically ignore from a different creator as part of a destroyed franchise it's like are you kidding me that's like the most vestigial limb of all of this the, this is the, yeah this is the annoying thing because the premise isn't terrible it's like you know each you know each season maybe she hires a different team of misfits to go on another suicide squad type mission and like you can do a lot of fun stuff with that i think that's a good premise but like just calling it waller like it's a character that like ugh, like no one cares that much about her like she's just there to facilitate the the Suicide Squad movies like I don't want to see her personal life or anything like that. It's not that yeah, important. At, at least call it Rise of the Waller or something to be in line with Hollywood and their titles. <laughs> Rise of Waller or the the you know like some something like that. Like how many times have we seen them add Rise to a movie? You know what I mean? It's just if they're gunning for like a uh suicide squad chronicles type of tv show you know like uh maybe a series of different stories that relate to her antics with them call it something to do with that don't call it waller and then sell it to me as this is a continuation of peacemaker it's like wait but wait but you try to track all of this timeline shit man you're like what's going on because this you can imagine the difficulty right you got to launch a batman you're like cool we can do that and it's like yeah but it's got to be separate from the batman and you're like oh uh, uh what's how does any of <laughs> Yeah, I, I think they. I think still going forward with that idea, I don't. I don't think that's going to work out for them having several bat folk. Uh, I, yeah, I just. Don't, I don't think up. that's a good idea. <laughs> it's it, like multiversal stories. I. I just hate. I, 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 I can't be honest with like, it. Everybody I just want to. Can... My one thing that like I just. I know it's kind of divisive because some guys are like, "Yeah, awesome." I'm like, that's to me is one of the worst things that have happened to uh comics for example and i think one of the greatest things to happen in comics was the crisis on infinite earth where it attempted to merge all these damn universes uh uh together but having a million versions of the same same guy is just not i just don't see how you can get people invested in that i mean even with dc where you had this joker and that joker and then you had one in the gotham as well for anybody that watched that it's like yeah, man, I don't think that's that's what people want want to see. You know what I mean? These different versions, and they always sell it like, well, this is this universe's version of this. It's like, 
Yeah, man. Uh, good luck trying to get people in, in, invested because I can't take it serious at that point. Oh, fuck. You're right. Yeah, because we got Joker coming in the next Batman movie probably, right? Because he was in... <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. But then we got, we got Joker 2 coming yeah, in as well. As... Yeah, you're going to get several Jokers with then Harley if have, Quinn. If you have Brave and the Bold and they have a Joker in that yeah. too. Like, good God. <laughs> they're going to be all over the place. And then we're going to get a Joker's movie, aren't we? <laughs> Spider-Man No Way Home. The Joker. Joker. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> oh man, that's gonna be terrible, man. But I can see a world where they actually do that. And now, considering DC copies everything Marvel, yeah. they probably yeah, would do the, that. the Jokers, yeah, like yeah. the Marvels, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man, that sounds terrible. It really does. <laughs> I just want a consistent timeline, right? Where yeah, stuff I'm matters, like, where yeah. there's consequences and yeah. they are lasting. Absolutely. You know, if someone dies, then they're dead. Like, yeah. that's it. You can't keep bringing people back. You can't keep agree. cheating. So, in other words, the Ripaverse, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Critical drinker? laughs> yeah. Still our company. Oh, yeah. Listen, okay. I could teach you guys the power of writing this stuff. You just say, somehow Palpatine returned. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> through all of this. <laughs> Terrible. When oh, they put that man. to paper, they must have known. They must have been laughing. They were like, "Yeah, <laughs> <It's, laughs> we know what uh, we've done." I just, Somehow. yeah, the answer to all of these things would, it, like, in that script, would have just been, "Don't think about it. Just move on to the next scene as quickly as possible." Just, we are already yeah. running out keep of it, time. Okay, just put yeah, it keep it going. Back. Keep it going. Give us a time a time limit. You know, like that. will do. Joker <laughs> Somebody yeah. said Spider Man into the Waller verse. <laughs> 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 More, Mueller versus Waller. Why not? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Rob. Like I know that uh, you know you've you've been very lucky in that you've had access to um, Picard season three before the rest of us. So you know, yes, you know what I've, it's like. I've and watched, I know I've watched the season all the way through three times. And you Which, have don't tell yeah. Paramount that or CBS that <laughs> they're they're not my <laughs> biggest fans over there. No, well, I, I, I should that, say. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say that. Uh, like, I know you've obviously been critical of the first season or two, and then yeah, your opinion has completely turned around with this one. And I know from what you've said on Twitter, like you've <clears throat> absolutely been loving it. Um, I, I have to say, uh, you know, who I heard has watched the. They've released six episodes to the um, to to various critics or people, and you know who another person who I actually like very much is Dave Cullen who's in mm -hmm. your neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. And he has hated hated modern Star Trek and done great videos on it. Apparently, now I haven't had this confirmed for me, but he liked what he saw as well. And here's, here's the thing. I've called it the great Star Trek hostage crisis. Since 2009, Star Trek has been uh, in the thralls of people that don't like it. There are people that take, took on the mantle of making Star Trek. When I watched Star Trek 09, I was shown 20 minutes of it about four or five months before the movie came out. This is J.J. Abrams' first Star Trek movie. I don't think I've ever been seething with as much anger in my life as I was walking out of that 20 minutes. I hated it so much. And then when the movie came out, I had to watch J.J. Abrams talk about on the, on, the, on the interview circuit how he never liked Star Trek growing up, yeah. that he was a Star Trek guy, a Star Wars guy. So... I have been very dismayed at what Star Trek has become. It's you know it's obviously my favorite franchise. I made a movie with William Shatner. Um, I I love Star Trek, and it's something that's been with me my whole life. Now, one of the things, and I have ha I hated Star Trek Picard seasons one and two, and the thing was I spent three years of my life making Next Generation documentaries that are if you watch the Blu-rays, you buy the Blu-rays. We we made Roger Lay and I. June, Roger Lay and I, for three years, the two of us, that's all we did was make documentaries for CBS about Star Trek The Next Generation. I sat down and I interviewed the entire cast for hours at a time. And I am very fond of all of those people. So when I saw, the, the, this is a very funny thing. So Terry Metallis, here's, here's some backstory. So Terry Metallis, who is the sole showrunner of Star Trek Picard season three, began his career as an intern working in post-production on Deep Space Nine. Then he moved over and he became Brandon Braga's assistant on Voyager and Enterprise, and then went on with Brandon and worked on shows he created like Threshold. 
And then off on his own, he worked on shows like Nikita as a writer, which was an adaptation of La Femme Nikita. And then he became the co-showrunner and creator of the 12 Monkeys TV series that was based uh, on the movie. And the movie was based on Chris Marker's 60s short La Jete. And so what happened was when he was brought into Star Trek on, on Picard season two, back on Star Trek, they had really decided what they were going to do. And he wrote a couple of episodes, but he didn't have any control over the shape of the show. It had already been decided by Alex Kurtzman, Akiva Goldsman, Michael Chabon. And they all left to go do other things. Akiva Goldsman went off to do Strange New Worlds. Akiva Goldsman uh, had control over that. He left Picard behind him. Alex Kurtzman went on to do his pseudo-sequel to The Man Who Fell to Earth. So Terry was basically given Star Trek Picard Season 3 because no one else wanted it. And he was told he can do anything he wanted. He was literally given carte blanche to do whatever he wanted. And one of the first things he did was he got rid of most of the cast of Picard that we'd seen in the first two seasons. The only one he retained was Rafi because he had something he planned for her, which you'll see is very different than the the role she had been given. And then he's like, look, everybody, this show should have been this from the very beginning, but he went back and he got all the original cast of Next Generation to come back. And he got his writing staff from 12 Monkeys. If you haven't seen the 12 Monkeys show, it's 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 really clever, I thought. He got a new he got his composer from 12 Monkeys. The music in Picard season 2 3 is completely different. He got his DP, so even though the trailers look a little People are saying it looks the same. It's a different looking show. It's much more cinematic. It when you watch Picard season three, nothing about it after the first ten minutes because they, the first ten minutes are at Chateau Picard and then we're off to the races. But it's <clears throat> it's a very different feeling show. The format is different. Everything about it's different, and you can tell when you watch the first episode. Um, it feels like Star Trek. What Terry wanted to do was make a 10-hour Star Trek movie, because none of the Next Generation movies are very good. Even First Contact is lacking, even though Terry, that's his favorite. But it feels like, and I, I, when I say this, I hope people take it in the spirit it's intended. It feels like Top Gun Maverick in the Star Trek universe in the sense that all of these characters come back together. And I'll tell you, in the setup, like for instance, Picard hasn't seen Dr. Crusher in 20 years. Dr. Crusher is basically has become Doctors Without Borders, and she's been working on the edge of Federation space, helping non-aligned worlds with pandemics, or she's basically, it's almost like she's working in, in, in third world nations, bringing them medicine and supplies when they need it. She's basically become kind of a medical space pirate with this gentleman that she's working with. And all the characters, Worf is, maybe he's working for an intelligence organization, you don't really know. And so it's all very intriguing. And it's like reading, it, 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 you, the characters are very disparate. I mean, they have to deal a little bit with what happened in Picard seasons one and two. But in a way, they openly mock it <laughs> on a number of occasions. And when I watched this, I was sitting, the first time I watched this, I was like, huh. And it wasn't until I got the end of episode four, the first four episodes are like its own arc. And it was so entertaining. And when it ends, it ends on a very next generation esque note. And then when we got into episode five, there's a conversation somebody I didn't expect to ever see again comes back. And I'm like, oh my God. And um, there's a conversation that's one of my favorite conversations between any two characters in Star Trek ever. And it, it turns into a big, it, it is not about. Honey Bunny taking revenge. It's not a replay of Wrath of Khan. It's a much larger story. And it has undercurrents of real emotion and pathos. And I guarantee you, I'll make a bold prediction. There won't be a dry eye in the house at the beginning of episode nine. And no one dies in that episode. I'm just saying that it was, I was, I was blown away by it. Now, is it perfect? No, nothing is, is, is perfect. But it's such a change of any of the Star Trek that we've seen in the last 14 years. You will, the bridge crew 
of the Discovery. I don't know them. I don't know their ranks. I don't know what they do. The bridge crew of the Titan A, you like all those people. You like all those people in the first couple of episodes. And it it feels like a science fiction action adventure show. What Star Trek always was. At its core, and I'll tell you something else. At the end of episode four, when what's going on is going on, it's about really smart people really knowing their jobs. They're not crying about it. They're doing it because they're good at what they do. Because Star Trek is about the best of the best. And what Star Trek has turned into is a show about how mediocrity is what gets you to the final frontier. And I, Star Trek Discovery, to me, is the anti-Star Trek. Everything about that show is so wrong on so many levels. Star Trek Picard returns Star Trek to where it should be, about human beings and their alien uh, friends striving to be the best they can be and uh, in the face of great adversity and uh, stepping up. And it's not about, oh, if it's what you feel, it's okay. No, no, no. What you feel is going to get what you feel is going to get you killed. You know what's not going to get you killed? Really knowing how to do your job and and working with other people that are really smart and know how to do their jobs. We have to put our emotions aside and get the job done. And that's what Star Trek to me was about. It was about being the best person, human being you can be and finding the best people around you, the best of the best to go out and that's what you need to be on the final frontier otherwise you will get killed. You will never survive. And Star Trek Picard is all about these people that are the best of the best coming back together and doing what they do best. And it was refreshing to watch. I mean, it sounds great to hear. You know, it it feels like that's what they should have done 14 years ago. Um, And there's a part of me that's like, well, basically, I want want to make some points about this in a second. But just before I do, um, I know that Jeremy is is pretty much out of time here. I know you've got some stuff you need to take care of, man. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, It was pleasure being on with all you guys. I won't spend any much time because I think you got a great conversation going. But Robert, always great to see you. We'll have to uh, get you on or I'll have to come on your channel. Good to see you, sir. Rip, I'm tired of seeing you. I see you way too much every week. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, yeah, so <laughs> Monday, so be ready for that, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Mahler, it's always great to meet you for the first time. And yeah, drink always drink. great. <laughs> so you guys have a good one. Bye, chat. Uh, Thanks, Mahler man. out. See you, dude. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, like I, I was just saying there, um, you know, it, it really sounds like they've they've taken it back to what people wanted the whole time. Um, and particularly with something like Picard, you know, we wanted to see that reunion of the original cast, and oh, yeah. they they kept us waiting for two seasons and didn't do it. And you know, it's great that they've they finally got someone in charge who seems to know what he's doing and is giving people what they've been looking for this whole time. I worry that it's an Andor type situation where it's like finally you're getting something that had a lot of thought and care put into it that really captures what people are looking for, but. People might not ne- may not necessarily watch it because they've been so burned oh, in the past, you know. I, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you what's going to have to happen. First of all, unlike this is wildly entertaining, and it's like Star Trek. It's fun, and when I say it's fun, it's still got big stakes, and there's a lot of emotion. But it's it's you're watching a pulp sci-fi show. I mean, let's face it, Star Trek had go-go boots and miniskirts in the original series. <laughs> And there was there was an element. You have to have an element of it's 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 pulp sci-fi. Gene Roddenberry sold the show as a wagon train to the stars. He was playing on the fact that westerns were the most popular thing on television back in the early you know early to mid '60s. And what's so great about this is, you know, when you were watching Picard season one, if you watched it, I did not believe that the character that Patrick Stewart was playing was Jean Luc Picard. I did not believe that he would be writing books in his chateau. That chateau represented a place he left. Now, in Family, the opening of the fourth season of Next Generation, after the the Borg situation, after Locutus, he goes home. But he goes home and he makes peace with it, and then he leaves. The last place, Picard would be an archaeologist on some far-flung planet finding Iconian gateways or something. He would not be a sad sack at home on Earth. That's not what Picard would do. And I understand that 
to get Patrick Stewart back, he was able to put a lot of his own life, especially in season two, that he came from a real abusive household, and they added that into the Picard backstory, which made no sense in the Star Trek universe, that a mother, a mother, a woman couldn't get the the psychiatric help that she needed, and she ended up killing herself. I mean, literally, they thought that was a good story idea, that Captain Picard's mother hung herself because she was mentally ill. This is not a Star Trek story. In the Star Trek future, people get the help they need, you know, and 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 we have interspecies marriages. No one's talking about, um, you know, their pronouns or anything like that. We have a much more evolved, developed civilization, and it's Star Trek is is again. I always say this: Star Trek does not tell you what to think. Star Trek offers things to think about, and and it, it it's it's like a lot of other things. It's been frustrating to watch that to happen to my favorite franchise. And not only that, but even in Strange New Worlds, you have the writers openly pillaging other writers and not not crediting them. And like, for instance, I'll give you an example. Ursula K. Le Guin, a favorite science fiction writer. She's one of the greatest of all time. Uh, she wrote a short story called Those Who Walk Away from Umlas that I re- recommend everybody read. They stole it. They literally stole it for an episode of Strange New Worlds. Like they outright told that story, albeit in their Star Trek framework. And Alex Kurtzman gets up on interviews and says, yes, we were very inspired by Ursula K. Le Guin's story. Well, they didn't. (laughs) Very inspired. They they didn't credit her. And I go back and I, you you go back to the first season of the original series. There's an episode called Arena that everyone remembers because that's what the Gorn is from. Well, that story was based on a short story by an author named Frederick Brown. Frederick Brown is credited. Um, the backstory of uh, Rebecca Romaine's character, number one, the backstory of her character on Strange New Worlds was lifted from the one Star Trek novel that Dorothy Fontana wrote called Vulcan's Glory. Dorothy Fontana wrote for the original series. She wrote episodes like Journey to Babel, Defined the Vulcan Culture. Well, they just took the entire backstory for this character from her novel without accreditation. And, and I get it. The, the, well, we own that book. We can do whatever we want. At least give her a special thanks. I mean, yeah. she, she shaped Star Trek and turned it and made it what it was, like Gene Kuhn. And they're not giving that credit. Terry Metalis is paying homage and is giving credit to the entire history of the Star Trek franchise all the way throughout Picard. As a matter of fact, there is the most obscure reference in terms of Easter egg to a Star Trek novel. I could not believe, no one's going to get it. But if you've ever read, I, I, can't, I don't want to say what it is, but there, I couldn't believe he did it. And it's sprinkled throughout the show. There is so much love and care put into Star Trek Picard if you are a fan of Star Trek. And also, it's just a rousing, fun space adventure that has villains and there's conspiracies and there's all different kinds of aliens and there's even there's even it's very subtle but there's a great fuck you to modern star trek in it well i'm all in favor of that for sure and uh, uh, it's great yeah i mean it just kind of makes me wonder where the whole franchise is going to go ultimately you know well, say this this it, this season does particularly well it's meant to be the end for picard anyway so like they're not going to get any more picard season four or anything but like what can they do going forward? Yeah, it's well. I'll tell you something. The end of the show definitely tees up what could be the next Star Trek series, which okay. they probably won't. I mean, Terry Metalis is no longer. He's gone over to Disney to do Escape to Witch Mountain, so he really has nothing to do with Star Trek anymore. Everyone thinks that I'm such a fan of this show because he's going to give me a job. He doesn't work on Star Trek anymore. <laughs> maybe Just, maybe they'll bring him back. Yeah, it's like a one and done for him. Um, yeah. But yeah, like they're not going to be doing any more movies anytime soon. Like they've, they don't seem to have the budget for it anymore. Like none of the actors want to be involved. Um, yeah, it's it's going to have to be TV, I guess. Yeah, I mean, got, be... got no uh, wonders about it. that. Sounded incredibly genuine the past like twenty minutes for me. I believe everything you're saying about that show, and I wish the best for uh, <laughs> Star Trek fans. As someone who's watched like zero Star Trek, I'm just like, oh, I hope you get a good season, guys. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I mean, just you know, one, know, one good I, thing. I, I know it's it's not everyone's favorite. It's funny because it's 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 it, Star Trek was always niche. 
it was never main, mainstream. The closest it came to being mainstream was when Star Trek The Next Generation went off the air in 94. They were developing Voyager, and the Star Trek Generations movie came out six months after All Good Things aired. And it was on the cover of Time magazine. And um, uh, it's always been niche. You know, it, it always struggled in the ratings. I mean, the movies did well, but they were never blockbusters. And that's why it was always odd to me that Paramount would spend $175 million, $200 million on those J.J. Abrams Star Trek movies because they didn't, they didn't earn out. Because you can't, a $200 million Star Trek movie is never going to return its investment. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. And they, they just became like these generic sci-fi action movies well, that just... I almost like exploded when you were like, you know, oh, he was a bad fit for Star Trek because he always he considered himself a Star Wars guy. And it's like, did you see what he did to Star Wars? <laughs> well, that, that's, I mean, I mean, I have to say, um, as a feature filmmaker, for me, J.J. Abrams has made five uh, bad science fiction movies. And nothing is, I mean, I would dare say that The Rise of Skywalker might be one of the worst science fiction movies ever made. I would rather watch Plan 9 from Outer Space <laughs> than watch The Rise I of agree. Skywalker. I mean, it's yeah. it, it's it's a film it's a film that I, I I mean to be to be honest, I tuned out when they were hyperspace skipping and the Millennium Falcon comes out of hyperspace in the middle of a city. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, did you not watch Star Wars? You know, going through hyperspace ain't like dusting crops, boy. Not anymore, yeah. baby. You, you bounce like, too close to a supernova, and that'll end your trip it, real quick. It was just, yeah, it was. It was an entire movie trying to undo the the fuck up of TLJ, and so made their own yeah. fuck up. Who's I was gonna yeah, say? Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, it's just Robin up, Peter to pay Paul. You you bring up like the light speed skipping. It's just like, well, that that can't even compare, can it, to the hyperspace kamikaze? Do you remember when that everyone talking about that? It's like you just annihilated all Star Wars space battles. Good job, like. Oh, oh. They, well, he did the same. They did the same thing in uh, with the transporter in Star Trek 09. Suddenly, you know, the transporter. One of the great things about science fiction, as a genre, when you create tech, whatever future tech it is, the reason that it works for readers or watchers is because you have to make it believable. And the transporter was always a line of sight device. You know, you had to have proper coordinates, and you had to be over something. And in Star Trek 09. A ship traveling at warp, you can beam on a from a planet to a ship traveling at warp that every every split second the the, the ship is never in the same place. There are no coordinates to beam to, and it was yeah. they completely ruined the transporter. They they ruined it further in, into darkness when you could beam from a one man ship to the Klingon homeworld. <laughs> Why would you need starships? And it's it's this kind of thinking that is frustrating. And I think that what what. Terry Metallus and his writing staff did with Picard season three was they decided, okay, we're going to tell a, a proper Star Trek story that is steeped in Star Trek lore and Star Trek mythology and Star Trek history. And, um, and then also at the same time, there's an undercurrent of character characterization all the way through. And you can tell by the end of that first episode that this is a very different show. Helps with that I mean, right? When you have rules that make sense, at least someone. Because it's funny, you're bringing the, the, up the, the whole idea of how can you get coordinates when it's happening at the split second. There are people out there who'll be like, I don't even know how that seems fine to me. But Rise of Skywalker, they didn't know which way was up. <laughs> like that, yeah. I feel like that's that's where you've really taken it to the point where it's just like, who in the world is following this story? Like, But you, you like... JJ Abrams' solution to all this stuff is like if we just say it really quickly and everyone's running about yeah. like being like super urgent and there's a ticking clock, like, well, you don't even have time to question it because you're on to the next scene or the next chase or the next explosion before you can even process what's been said. Yeah, no, uh, and that's that's that. how they get by. Dynamic <laughs> yeah. camera work, those those lens flares, all the characters like rushing no matter what. Even in a normal scene, they might be rushing and the camera's moving around with them. It's just like, what's happening? I don't even know, but I am excited. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's just like, don't think, just do. Just just go with it, you know? Yeah. But. I mean, look, at the end of the day, all we all want is, what I want is authorship. I want to see, it's like what Eric July's done with his Ripaverse. You're getting a vision. You're getting a point of view. And you're getting somebody who's carrying out that point of view and really understands what story they're trying to tell. And I think that's, we all, we've become, we're fans of the stuff that we all love, whether it's great video games, whether it's great comics, television, movies, whatever, we want to feel that the people that are telling us these stories 
really understand the stories they're telling. That's all we're asking for. Absolutely. And you know, it's interesting, whether it's in a low budget, I keep talking about this is going to, there's a, there's a, you might know this movie, uh, Drinker. There's a movie called Stone Cold about mm-hmm. Brian Bosworth infiltrates the old team. The, it, it, Brian Bosworth, who's not an actor, plays an undercover cop that infiltrates a biker gang. And Lance Henriksen's the leader of the biker gang. This is a B movie directed by Craig Baxley, who's a stuntman turned director. It is a movie nobody would ever say is great, but it is great. It is a great B action movie because everybody who was making that movie knew exactly what kind of movie they were making. Everyone laughs at me when I bring up Stone Cold. But when you watch it, you're like, you know what? That was good. That there's was there's good. so many. Yeah, but there's so many of those kinds of movies, especially yeah. from like the 80s and the 90s when they didn't have the budget. But like they they really put the effort in to they make something to entertaining. It. Yeah. Yeah. And like they, they had to, you know, they had to get creative with how they did things. But like you could tell that like the people who wrote this and the people who, who uh, made it happen, they cared about what they were doing. And that, that counts for so much more than like a $200 million yeah. um, movie that feels like it was written and directed by an AI. That's, yeah. that's the difference, man. No, and the people, and that's what we want. You know, it's funny, like what, what Eric did, like Eric, you, I, I've always wanted to ask you this because I, I followed your campaign. Did you already have the 96, because I've self-published comics myself, Mm -hmm. did you have the 96-page comic already finished before you launched your crowdfunding campaign? Yes, I finished, uh, so that was kind of the approach where it acted more as a a pre-order campaign because we finished everything. Like I was getting, uh, they were in print, they were, like even the merchandise was basically on demand. And the books were were done completely. So every, I paid everybody off, my artists, everything. I, I spent probably on an upward just to get the damn thing off the ground. Probably on upward of almost three hundred thousand dollars of my own money, where I put I fronted that, um, and it was risky, but you know it, it worked out. So I made sure everything was ready um, before we launched. That's why we were able to get it out so quick. You know, after the pre order. You know, but so that's the way to run a crowdfunding yeah. campaign, and you definitely you. You know, let me ask you this: How long did Isom Number One? How how many how much time did that represent from the time you came up with the idea to the time you had your finished book in hand? Oh man, I, I guess if I, I'm trying to isolate the book, it's a little difficult because you know it was doing being done at a time when the actual company, you know, just all the the legal legalese bull crap that I had to do with deal with uh just to get it you know the foundational stuff and because we acted as our own distributor where to be with the logistics of the warehouse all that was being done at the at the same exact time uh but like you know we were working on i don't think i've ever uh, you know this is inside information i don't think i've ever told anybody this but we were working on probably like a five page a week kind of um a pencil and ink and then basically taking five days or, or five uh, pages of color a week as well. Um, so you can add that up to get the 96 pages. So that was about how long that it took wow. just to, to actually do the pen. So you're talking about the letters probably adding an additional week, uh, a couple of weeks or so to just get that done. But yeah, it took it took several months, obviously, to just, just finish the bad boy because it was such a big book. Now, how much time did you put into creating the character and the rip of that was a itself? year? That was a year. Like, believe it or not, I spent I uh, like I have a universe Bible, like a legitimate actual universe yeah. Bible uh, that I built out that took about a year to just build that out. So, like, I got uh, I some has his own entry, Yaira, Afqua, all these other characters that I introduced. And obviously there's stuff in there that we didn't introduce in the first book, but I wanted to flesh them out like kind of the ideas that I had. And it was also it, it makes it easy for, you know, because we haven't announced the, the team that's part of the other two books outside of ISOM 2 that we're going to release this year. Uh, but it was easy for me to just give them that sheet. Right. Like the, the, the entry, if they're doing a character that I created and say this is what they're all about. So that kind of that level of continuity is there um, and it'll always be present. So but I built that I built the uh, universe Bible. That was before I actually put. Pen. There was a, a couple of characters that got introduced as I was writing the story, but most, the vast majority of the characters, I was just building out the universe first and foremost before I ever even um, like wrote, started writing the actual uh, panels. Drinker, how long does it take you to outline a book? Or do you, well, what's your process? 
So, yeah, the usually the way I approach it is I'll write like a detailed synopsis of my book. So mm. that usually ends up being about 10, 15 pages. That's pretty much everything that's going to happen. All the character beats, all the main plot points, everything. Uh, that usually takes me uh, probably a few weeks to write something like that. Um, that gives me my idea for, for where I want to take the book. And then, yeah, then you get down to the business of actually writing it page by page. And that's probably about six months of work to get that done. And, and Mahler, when you do your epic videos, <laughs> how much time do you spend um, laying those out before you start actually produ producing them? Oh, God, it's a nightmare process. I think maybe the best way to illustrate this one is after I watched The Boys Season 2 and I despised it, I went to work on a script. I got uh, through the whole thing, and I estimated it would come to, I think, I want to say seven hours, eight hour video it would be if I was to make it based on my word count. Redrafted it. I got through it the second time, and then um, I was already like, it's, it's too late. I've taken too long. I've got to work on my next other thing. So that's just sitting on my hard drive now, and it drives me nuts the amount of times because the scripting to make those videos, like the Doctor Strange one, um, it's just something you just... I've told people before, it's like I start out with notes, then I categorize them all, then I do a chronological breakdown. I even do drafts to add humor. Like I'll try and go through them and see where I can inject it. And uh, But yeah, I, one of the big pieces of advice I give to people who are saying like this startup, I... I love redrafting because of the power it has in terms of improving my work, at least for my POV. So, But see, the, the point I was making with all three of you guys is that when you do the work that you do, you put all the thought into it. You do the work. And I think one of the reasons that people are fans of all three of you, I know that, that, that you know, I started watching Drinker, your videos, and Mahler, your analyses of, of these franchises was because the value that I would get out of watching your work. And knowing that all three of you, you put in the time, you put in the authorship, that is what we all expect from at least when you have $200 million. You'd be surprised how much authorship is not put into the creation of those things. And I think that's what we're feeling with all of our franchises is that the franchises are now, you know, people get a hold of them and they can use it as a money-making um, uh, thing but then the people that are working on the franchises, it's just a job for them. Like you watch Star Trek Discovery and it's like half the conversations characters are having could be from any show, not necessarily a Star Trek show. And you feel like they're just writers that have been hired to do this job. And the reason I like Star Trek Picard season three so much is that Terry Metalis came on and said, this could be the only time I get to make Star Trek that I want to make. And you feel it yeah. in the show. And I think that I feel the same way about about um, you know Andor, the guys who worked on Andor, you know, Academy Award winning screenwriter who who made a movie called Michael Clayton. He wasn't necessarily a big Star Wars fan, but in coming on, like when Nicholas Meyer did Star Trek II, he didn't know so much about Star Trek, but he knew about classic storytelling, and he he brought that to to the movie. And and he cared, guys, and he had cared. a bit of professionalism about him as well, like which, which always helps. Absolutely, um, and, and he that's probably did. I, if he took criticism, I'm sure he, his first instinct wasn't to lash out at the the fan base and blame them for all of his woes. <laughs> you know, no. that's well, that's the thing. I mean, but that's 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 the um, and and I think that's what's missing. You know, we grew up with entertainment. All the if you think back to, you know, when James Cameron made Aliens, that was that was his life, man. <laughs> I mean, everything. You know, he he was like. He was going to put everything that he had went into that movie. You know, you know how many aliens they had to make that movie. How many actual alien suits they had to make aliens? I think they only had four or something. They had six. They had six. Six, yeah, that was six good. alien suits. And I mean, he made it work because yeah. he knew how to do it. And and we grew up, you know, when Bob Gale and Bob Zemeckis made Back to the Future. You look at that screenplay. That is a great script. That is a very tight script. You know, you watch that. And we grew up with these movies that all worked. We became fans, and now we're getting. I heard a, I heard a very high-ranking studio executive tell me my it's my new favorite term. He's very high-ranking. He said he was tired of what he called fraudulent creators. That there are these people that work their way up in Hollywood, they get paid a lot of money, and they can't. They might have had one success, but they 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 skate by on that success, and they can't deliver. And they get paid a ton of money. And he called them all fraudulent creators. And he said that's the bane of the industry. And it's been my, I heard this 
back in December, and I I have I have not stopped thinking about it, and I keep I keep looking at things going. This is a fr- this is a this is the result of fraudulent creation. Yeah, and um, that's what happens, man. And it sucks. Uh, it really does. That's why we we get so much of what we we get nowadays. Uh, but Rob, I, I know uh, you're pretty much out of time yourself as well, yes. um, and so I, I don't want to keep you because I know you've got things you need to get to. Uh, but I do want to say, man, thanks for for coming in for this. I very much appreciate it. Thanks for the invite, the three of you. I, I I'm a huge fan of everybody, and um, you guys have all done again authorship. When you tune in or buy your comics or watch your videos, you know that you're getting not fraudulent creation. You're getting something that was thought about, puzzled over and designed to be exactly what it was supposed to be. And I think that's what we all want to see and experience. Hell yeah. Well, man, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so Shout much for coming out, All right, gentlemen, I will see you later, and thanks for the stream. Thank you. Peace out. Uh, yeah. Um, the, the only other thing I was going to cover um, was this, this great article that I saw about from Bounding Into Comics about Phoebe Waller-Bridge taking over Tomb Raider, um, which just brought a real <laughs> chuckle to me uh i'll just i'll share it it's probably the easiest way to do it actually give me just one second oh it's the bestest news you can get oh, it really wow. is like if i think about who would i want to take over lara croft uh it's got it's gotta be her so yeah i'll just if you give me one second i'll just read through some of it here so <laughs> She's rumored to write a new Tomb Raider TV series as part of the Tomb Raider universe at Amazon Studios. So, a new rumor. Tomb Raider universe? (laughs) Yeah, because that's what we need. It's going to be a multiverse of Tomb Raider ideas. (laughs) We'll have like 10 different versions of Lara Croft. The Raiders like it. So, apparently, yeah, she's going to be in the upcoming Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny movie, which we're extremely excited about. She's also going to write a Tomb Raider TV series, apparently, as part of Tomb Raider Universe Amazon Studios. Uh, this new rumor comes from Deadline, who claims that Waller Bridge will write a TV series as part of a potential Tomb Raider universe that would span television, film, and games. You know, because they're video games. Um, yeah, she could also be involved in the potential movie. So, uh, yeah. I'm just getting this. <laughs> oh god, it's killing me here. Oh, I don't uh, to do with this character, man. Like, uh, really, anybody it seems these days. Um, I don't think they know what to do with Laura Croft. Like, even game. They they haven't known since since they did the rebooted version of Tomb yeah. Raider because. I tell you, man, if you compare the, the Lara Croft that we have now in the games to what she was in those early games back in the, the 90s and the 2000s, she's a completely different yeah. person. Man. And she's nowhere near as cool. She's nowhere near as likable. She is just a generic action star with daddy issues who cries and mopes her way through most of her games and just bears no relation to Lara Croft. Yeah, I think that's the in- intriguing thing, but I think that also, unfortunately, gives them that kind of, uh, I guess, segue into modernizing kind of her, which is she's not a character that necessarily needs that, but it does seem like they're kind of going to lean more so in on like um, she's doing this for the reasons of like justice and trying to kind of retrieve artifacts to return them to her. Uh, to, to return them to the rightful cultural uh, kind of <laughs> yeah. say, like as opposed to when she used to be just doing it for the thrill uh, of it all and was more of like if you're going to call her like uh, uh, it's more of an anti-hero uh, than anything so it, it, if that's the direction that they're going which it all signs point to that yeah it's 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 not going to be Laura Croft it's not going to be uh, Tomb Raider it's just going to be some chick going about kind of living out whatever kind of uh, movie or TV or game script um, fantasy of, of whoever's writing it, um, Waller Bridge included, I guess. That's that's exactly it, man. Like When I look back at those uh, those original versions of Lara Croft, she was pretty edgy when you yeah, when you look at her in, in modern context, man. Because, like, yeah, she was straight up like, yeah, I'm just going to go and plunder these tombs and keep yeah. all this stuff for myself. Yeah. What are you going to fucking do about yeah. it? It's mine now, you know? Well, yeah. More anti-hero than anything. But, 
uh, I guess that can't happen anymore. It's not they don't want uh, that sort of uh, approach with a lot of I guess the female heroes are kind of suffering kind of through that where they can't be like uh, uh, I guess edgy in 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 the modern sense. Um, I guess people are afraid to to write them as such. I don't really know what it is, but. Yeah, they're going in a more predictable, modernized uh, direction for Laura Croft. And I, that's just not the move um, at all, at all. But yeah, doing it for the thrill. If she's not doing it for that reason anymore, then it's it's not Laura Croft. It's just some chick kind of, again, her name only. Yeah, like every game that I've seen in this rebooted franchise has been like she's been caught up in something that's outside her control or, you know, she... Uh, someone she cares about is under threat. She's got to try and help them out, or it's all stuff like that. She doesn't want to be involved in any of it, and that's not an adventurer. Then that's just uh, that's just the random person that's been caught up in something, yeah. you know, that they want to get out of. And so, I was fine with that in the very first game because I thought, okay, fine, that's going to lead into her then becoming the real Lara Croft that we remember. But yeah. it's like she's never gotten there. It's just her stuck in this endless cycle of like being the the inexperienced character who's out of her depth and you can't keep playing that same card over and over man it just gets old true 100 percent. like yeah I, I don't i don't understand it um but they're not gonna let her be be her i, I didn't even know that there was gonna be more of a uh like i said that sounds kind of just hilarious the whole universe uh um <laughs> aspect of the laura croft verse the croft this the croft verse yeah whatever yeah, they're gonna call it i guess that's what the people want um over at amazon studios uh whatever man it's, it's probably i mean they haven't had too much luck with the movies like i i kind of like the first angelina jolie one i think i remember if you're gonna yeah. if you're gonna pick an actress to play liar croft i think she's probably the best yeah. choice in yeah. the, the early 2000s yeah and it was fun it was pretty tongue-in-cheek it was all right you know the second one was pretty boring and then when they did the the new one with like what was it alicia vikander um that yeah. was weird it just felt like she got she became like a black character in her own story like she had no real agency and she had no real presence on screen she just always felt like she was ashamed to be there somehow i don't know man it's, maybe it's the wrong actress maybe the script was a bit weird but uh it just made no impression on me i, I watched that film and then forgot about it like five minutes later <laughs> Uh, and so now what they're talking about here with Phoebe Waller-Bridge writing it, like she's a comedy writer. That's yeah. how she cut her teeth as a writer. She did uh, Fleabag over here in the UK. Uh, then she did like, um, oh Christ, what's it called? It was like a kind of spy spoof um, thing. Oh, I'm trying to remember what it was called. Chat will probably be able to help me out in this one. That's the thing. Um, I'm super unfamiliar with her work. I'm just waiting for it to come through. Uh, no, it wasn't Heat. Uh, it was basically like, uh, spent, spent, yeah, Killing Eve, that was it. That was what it was called. Couldn't remember it there. But, um, yeah, it was basically just uh, a spoof, like, subverting your expectations, um, spy comedy show. It was all very goofy and quirky and you know, all the rest of it. Um, and I think, why would you put someone like that in charge of Lara Croft? Yeah. That's, you're, you can, you're gonna turn Lara Croft into a joke now. Yes. That's exactly what they're going to do. You know it. Uh, man, and, and I mean, we're seeing that with a lot of the, uh, I know the comic book stuff is doing, kind of going down that similar route where all the movies start to, really all movies seem to go that route. Where they're starting to feel the same where they have to have that, uh, that comedic kind of um, approach. And that's really not going to work with, with the whole Laura Croft uh, situation. So if that is, if she's going to be leaving her imprint, and I don't believe writers. In this day and age, definitely where we're talking about Hollywood, I just don't think they got it in them to put that to the side. I mean, we kind of alluded to that. We talked a little bit about that with, like, James Gunn. I mean, I think to be someone that does something on source material that already exists, you have to be able to set kind of, hey, this is what the story that I would tell. Um, but if it doesn't make sense for that character, I just I can't put him in that environment just for the sake of leaving my imprint on it. And I just don't think a lot of people in this day and age – uh, particularly in a uh, really mainstream anything they just have it in them it's like i don't know if it's like a, a just cockiness like hey i have to leave my imprint on whatever it is that i'm creating um and i can't if it doesn't make sense for the character who cares it needs to make sense because that's like my flavor like i'm, I'm kind of putting my little seasoning 
on it. I just don't think they got it in to put that to us to the to the side. And Taika no, Waititi is a, is a prime example of that. Oh, absolutely. I think ego plays a huge part in it for a lot of these people, and it seems to almost go like without saying now like oh yeah of course like this character has to be adapted to, to um represent me as a writer like they have to be partly me on screen uh you know probably velma is a great example of yeah. that with mindy kaling it's like okay you've changed the race of the character you've you've completely changed their personality because she's like an idealized version of you it's just you stroking your own ego and putting this character in the show that's that's not what you're supposed to do as a writer. You're supposed to take yourself outside of your own life yeah. and use your imagination to make up these made-up characters that you can then work with. Like that's that's what you do with Isom. That's what yeah. you know all of us do as writers. It's it's not about like I need to see myself on this on screen or in this story. Uh, I'm just there to tell a story that's appealing to to people and to to me whatever. Um, yeah. It's just like yeah, it, it that's. That culture in Hollywood just seems to have really changed over the past five or ten years, and it's a weird situation we find ourselves in now. Yeah, hundred <coughs> percent. It's sad. I mean, like that's something that I was proud myself in doing, like with my work, is like trying to stay away from like the whole self insert. Like you have stuff that maybe will be of some sort of like inspiration, you know what I mean? But you know, it's I think there's a level of like relatability that people find regardless of culture there's universal truths there's stuff that you can kind of um, uh, uh, utilize as a vehicle to, to resonate with other people as opposed to just kind of just injecting yourself and your uh, preference uh, into the the story of especially characters that you know have already um, existed if you're going to be giving them personalities as opposed to just giving them different versions of your personality like it's more of trying to write what makes sense for the individual character and it, it to be fair it takes a you know some level of talent to be able um to do that because you kind of got to separate yourself uh just a, a little bit um to in order to do that and just a lot of people don't have have that in them i don't know if it's like a prerequisite with like, definitely hollywood like kind of you have to be that way like how do you get in a position like uh like that without kind of your ego being the primary driving force uh for, for whatever it is that you're trying to do so i think that's just so difficult for them to just just separate that everything has to be about them and, and their own individual egos and uh you know i think that's where the divisiveness kind of kind of comes from because it's so easy to pick up on like and this whole Velma situation has to be like more the more blatant versions like of that like that was about as on the nose as it gets <laughs> yeah that show has been something else man i mean it's been a gift to people who just wanted to you know yeah, have a laugh and make fun that. of it yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure I think collectively we've made more money out of that than HBO have or whoever's put it out. Like, <laughs> that's probably true, hundred percent. But uh, I mean, hey, man, it's uh, I guess this is this is the mindset now of people who are writing um, TV shows and and movies and stuff now. But uh, well, you know, I I can't wait for this this version of lara croft that's written by phoebe waller bridge to come out i'm sure it's going to be a riot hell yeah uh, i we've uh we've got a few super chats that have come in while we've been doing this and if we've got a little bit of time maybe try and get through a few i'm sure some of them are for you eric and um cool yeah i'll just try and get through them if we can uh just give me one second while i bring them up here mm -hmm. bear with me chat All right, so scroll, scroll, scroll. Where's the first one? All right, so <clears throat> the first one on the list was from uh, Ezra's <laughs> Ezra Miller's cellmate, who says, <laughs> <It's pretty good. laughs> "I almost don't need to do the rest." Uh, <laughs> Thoughts on David Corrin Sweat as Superman? Not a very well-known actor, but he's the top uh, fan cast to play the role. Solid option, but Cavill is better. I'm not familiar with him. I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah, I don't, don't know the guy, I'm afraid. Um, presumably, he's, I don't know, he's a pretty big-built guy to play Superman. But, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. Um, 
Chris Sullivan says, The fact that Gunn said the most important facet of his plan is the writers and scripts is all I need to know. Let's go. I mean, that's that's good. It's good that he's saying that. But, like, the projects that he's announcing, like we said earlier, it's not exactly filling us with joy, man. They're just, um... There's, you know, it could be good. It's just... I just, I just don't understand the strategy, that's all. No. Uh, the Thing With No Name says... Hello, I'd like to give a shout out to the usual suspect, an underappreciated reviewer. He was on the rise until the ad apocalypse sapped, sapped his income, uh, requiring him to get another job to support himself and thus causing his output to slow and the algorithm to hurt his channel. It's a shame to see, and I'd just like to send some support his way. His next video is a long look at box office bombs, so keep an eye out. P.S. While his film reviews are his bread and butter, don't overlook his game reviews. Great critique with a dash of humour that neither detracts from nor overshadows the actual review. So that's the uh, the channel's called The Usual Suspect. So, yeah, man. Mm -hmm. uh, hope you get hope you get back on the on the right track. Chuxenhausen says, Cobra Kai Happy Hour with Dark Hour. Dark Hour, will it happen? Um, I Well, yeah. I mean, happy to do something like that. Uh, and he also says, Bella Ramsey looks like an alien Zuckerberg. <laughs> I mean... Isn't that redundant? Alien Zuckerberg? Yeah. Um, yeah, she's got... I don't know how to describe her face. It's it's unique. It's unconventional for an actress. Yeah, I'll say that. Uh, Mikey Gussler says, Gunn is a liar and a hypocrite. Said a few years ago that he wouldn't do a Superman film because it's no interest. Uh, said the rumour of firing Henry was false and then he did it anyway. And he just confirmed this clean slate will include Momoa... Miller, Levi, and his wife and friends from the Suicide Squad and Marvel. He says it's about what audiences want, but during his presentation, it was all, I want this, and I like this. It's DOA. I mean, I don't entirely disagree. Yeah, no, with what he's, he's saying there. He, yeah, he's keeping a lot of the characters that they're keeping around, um, or obviously he was connected to them in some way, which, I mean, yeah, I guess it's understandable to have that kind of preferential treatment. So, not entirely yeah. incorrect. But the thing is, like, there's no way you can hide it. You know what I mean? Like, if the the only projects that get saved are the ones that are like the one that's got his wife in it or <laughs> shit. It's like people are gonna notice, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, he also, Mr. Lucas says, "Hello, gents. Uh, who's been character assassinated the worst in the MCU?" I think Mo could probably answer this one. Oh, that's a long list, but uh, I don't know. It might be. It depends. Everything gets weird when you think of Doctor Strange because of the whole um, incursions thing, right? Because people are wiping out universes casually and they don't seem to give a shit. Scarlet Witch, probably, you know, she went to the point of literally murdering Charles Xavier and Reed Richards because she's trying to kidnap children. She used oh, that to was alright, though. You're like, <laughs> I, I don't even know how to ex Anybody who doesn't know the context is like, what are you talking about? I'm like, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't help you. I don't know. But honestly, you could pick any of them at this point. I don't think it's the good. easy one for me is would have to be Th Hulk or Thor, but the yeah. nerd in me, I'm going mm -hmm. to say Monica Rambeau. Um, it start and it started with Captain Marvel with having her look up to uh <laughs> Carol Danvers, which was a damn crop. So that <laughs> I, I, I go there. I, I'm dude, when you said like uh James Gunn is more of a raid than like. Take away teaser. I was just like, as long as you you do know what he did to Thor, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Look, that. look, look that, that's that's uh, you're right there. Like, I mean, you know, I don't want to say too much, but yeah, it's it's. I do believe that he's probably worse. But Taika Wat, that's not a boost to Taika Watiti <laughs> by any means because he's fucking terrible. Um, Mr. Luca also said, uh, "Hail Tonald." Listening to EFAP 100 was emotional, Mauler. Yeah, we had uh, we had Tone Loke on to talk about. The stresses and sort of the, the the underside of like how YouTube can be like a quite a strain on your mental health and stuff. It was um it was good stuff. It was a good guest. Nice. Uh Waylon Pacifus says Batman Year One or the Long Halloween? For me, I, year one. I mean I can't answer that. <laughs> I don't Neither can I. I'm going I'm going with you, Eric. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, Waylon Bicephus also said bucket of 1980s AIDS or pregnant Joker's baby. Uh, I'd go for the AIDS to be honest. <laughs> it's less pregnant. offensive. Pregnant Joker. Uh, what were they doing, man? What were they doing? 
Uh, he also said, Howdy gents, I hope no one's alcoholism affects your alcoholism. Anyway, I think we could say that DC and their ship of fools needs a good old-fashioned purge like a supermodel stomach after a meal. Um, I mean, that's kind of what they're getting now, really. Well, they will force their own purge if they're not careful. Like, if they release a bunch of movies that either flop or are just outright terrible, it's like, good God. I was trying to ask this to Gary and Az. I was like, how many... How many flops can they handle? How many movies can they handle not reaching? Particularly like a with Warren, aren't they like in debt? Like just oh yeah, a, they're they're broke, man. Yeah, so particularly just from the economics of it all, like I yeah. just don't think they can stand it. It's a gamble. Um, next one was uh, Stephen Bubble. Hi everyone on the panel. I just want to know what is your take on the Forspoken Games mixed reviews? I played it, so I can I can speak on that. I uh, played a lot of it dialogues dog shit um but i don't play it I, I, like just as a gamer i don't play uh the games for that i played it on the the hardest mode and i think the gameplay obviously is the redeeming the biggest the best quality and the redeeming quality uh certain of it certainly of it but yeah they lean way too much into a lot of modern games are doing that to the whole cinematic movie kind of situation and i just it's a game you know i want to play the damn thing and uh, at least they gave me the option. Like, there's a toggle where you could have her talk less to her cuffs, which is awesome. <laughs> uh, so you could just you can put that on minimal, uh, and that makes it tolerable. She doesn't really talk to him unless it's part of like the story. But the gameplay is uh, for sure. Whoever designed the actual combat system and the traversal of the game, if we're just talking about strictly gameplay, they did a solid job. Hmm. Well, that sucks to hear that. The people who wrote the dialogue might have destroyed all of the other aspects of the game yeah. being that bad because that's all I've ever heard about <laughs> Spoken is the yeah, bad just the dialogue. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's so funny though. It feels like the devs were kind of aware of how shit the dialogue was that you've got an option to like turn it down to minimum. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Uh, LC Lappin says, looking forward to Drinker's video on Puss in Boots 2. Not just a good film, but has elements people desperately want to see in movies again. I mean, yeah, I've heard nothing but good things about Puss in Boots 2. Watch it. Watch it. The most random fucking movie. I know. I'll be honest with you, Drinker. When I booted it up, I was like, this is probably going to be fine. People are overblowing this. And then I watched it, I was like, okay, that was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> that was actually pretty good, yeah. Uh, Slack Attack says, while tender, Bill and Frank's story deviates from Joe and Ellie, neglects the encounter with the bloater, and does nothing to move the story along. Bill was fine as he was in the game, and this show needs to work on uh, Joel and Ellie. I mean, I agree with that last part for sure. Um, yeah, like I'm not liking their interactions, and it's not it's not getting me invested in their characters. So, I, I want a good, solid Joel and Ellie episode where they actually bond a little bit. We need that. Desperately. I agree, because they don't spend really any time together in episode one. Episode two, they're working on Tess, you know, because she's having her exit. And then episode three, they had some stuff, but it's not very much. And so it's like, are we finally going to get an episode with those two just going, walking around, doing stuff, dealing with the drama? Like, yeah, I'm with you on that. I would like to see that. Uh, Kyle Kernan says, would you rather live in, on Pandora or in Wakanda? Wakanda, I guess they have um, insane cool technology that would solve every problem. So, and you could even maybe try and convince them to save the world. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, like Pandora, you're on an alien world where basically everything can kill you. So, yeah, I'd, I'd go for Wakanda. Um, RRTNZ says, "Hail drinker, you hash brown legend. It's time to change your, your pronouns to sensei and student and do a Cobra Kai season five stream with Chucks and Housen." It seems like it is, yeah. Um, I am almost like, do I wait until season six comes out and then just cap it all off? You know, that's going to be the final season anyway. So, yeah. Either way, I'll get it done. Uh, Zerus says, I could have been satisfied by Avatar 2 if it just had a final battle as epic as the first movie, but this one was cramped, dark, and smaller in scale. Uh, I mean, it's yeah, I guess that's true. Like, um, But... It was more real, like it felt like it was taking place in real locations, and yeah, there's the part of me that, kill a ship. So yeah, I kind of like ships sinking and like you know all these rooms flooding with water and stuff, and you got to fight through that. I thought that's kind of a uh, cool environment for a showdown, you know. Um, so that was all right. It's just the the story of the movie was dog shit, you know. <laughs> that's the bigger problem. Agreed. Uh, uh, Unhinged says, I'm a peacock mauler, you've got to let me fly. 
things. The other guys. You guys seen that? The other guys? So, uh, I've seen bits of it, yeah. I'd, I'd pretty heartily recommend that. I actually rewatched it recently with Metal. It was good fun. It's just like the premise is you have like the superstar cops and then there are some other guys who work in the department and the story is about them. Would... Yeah, because the, the super cops like throw themselves off a building, <laughs> don't they? <laughs> yeah, that shit's great. They're going through like a, an average, you know, action scene and they're just dominating. They have plot armor there. Every decision they make works out perfectly. Every shot they take is just perfect. And the, it gets pushed to the extreme where they're at the top of a building. They look down at a concrete floor and they're like, right, we got to get the bad guys. So let's just jump down. And they do. And then they both die. <laughs> it's, just <laughs> it's just really funny. <laughs> Uh, Marksman says uh, all of this Hogwarts, sorry, all this talk of Hogwarts legacy, but no one mentions the Fallout slash Bioshock Soviet Union theme game Atomic Heart, original IP, and it looks great. Yeah, I saw some gameplay uh, this morning. Oh, that was my first time I'd ever heard of it. Um, looks looks all right. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'll be interested in checking that out. Uh, spiritual successor to Bioshock as a franchise, which was a spiritual successor to System Shock. How the Gaming industry keeps on churning, eh? Uh, <laughs> so many shocks. Uh, Kevbot says, Halo, I think we were better off 30 years ago. Quality comic books, an occasional animated show, and the extremely rare movie. Now it's just non-stop. We used to get excited for announcements like these, but now we dread them. I mean, that's definitely true. Yep. It was a different animal in the 90s, man. Like, it was just such so much peak, like, in each individual genre that was just going on during that during that period of time. I mean, we talk about just 30 years from like 93. I mean, you're talking about like X-Men the animated series, the Batman the animated series, all that stuff was, yeah, it's not going to get much better than that. Good luck. Yep. Uh, next one is Ishfin says, Fantasy Abbey casting. I'd go with Eddie the Beast Hall. <laughs> World's strongest man. Uh, yeah. I guess put this in a serious context though, like if you had to cast Abbey, who would you pick? Scott Steiner. <laughs> yeah, He's too seen, small. I've already seen people small, saying, like, um, you know, yeah, yes. you know, it's going to suck for whoever is actually cast as Abby because you're going to get so much shit. Like, whoever they end up choosing, uh, good luck to you, of course. <laughs> I, uh, you see what I made my last of us video right i had to i had to download the sex scene from last of us 2 and i, I obviously had to rewatch that bit and i still to this day i'm baffled by what i was looking at <laughs> i don't understand i'm baffled by the whole fucking game the last of us 2 was a mistake the whole thing was a huge yeah, mistake it was a problem man. it really was <laughs> Uh, Angry Batman said he sent a two-parter. So, as for current events, not excited for the new DC slate, except maybe the Authority. Superman will suck, and Batman will get replaced by Damien. Love the transphobic staircase bit from the other week, and the gift shop. Keep up the terrible <laughs> jokes. <laughs> that was from Hogwarts, wasn't it? I'm still, I'm still over the moon, fucking laughing at the stupid transphobic staircase. That's the most hilarious thing ever. It, if, it, Ripper, if you don't know it, basically, if if the wrong I guess Jenda goes up the stairs, it'll turn into a slide and send them back down. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's just what? pretty good. They're going to cancel the stick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's good. We're just going to have to use elevators to get everywhere now. Staircases are out. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Uh, Jacko says, Yo, Drinker, I got to see the final draft in for your Rogue Element short film. Um... Oh, sorry, I see you got the final draft. I was about to say, how the fuck did you see it, man? <laughs> no one's seen it yet. Uh, congrats on the milestone. Can't wait to see the final product. Yes, thank you. So we've, we've pretty much locked the script now. And we're now into the phase of casting, uh, finding like the right costumes, um, scouting out locations, and then we'll get on to shooting this bitch. So, yeah, that's, that's making movies. It's Hell fun, yeah. but it's really time-consuming. Uh, Zach Luna says, two very based reviewers. Drinkers should play some Dead Space too." Well, actually, yeah. look, there you go. I Ready did. to go. Uh, I just haven't had time to get it fired up yet, but I'm I'm going to do it soon. Um, Mario Tri Triillo says, uh, Afternoon Drinker, would you ever write a Star Trek-like sci-fi series or one-shot? We could use some well-written sci-fi from skilled writers. I had a couple of ideas. For a sci-fi novel or 
possibly like a, a novella um, that I might be interested in doing. But yeah, it, it takes quite a bit of time to do stuff like that. Same with fantasy, because you've got to create a whole new fictional world. Um, so it's uh, it's a bit bit bigger. But maybe. Uh, Marty Gray says, uh, Algren son, what happened to the warriors at Thermopylae? Dead to the last man. Yeah. You'll appreciate that one more. Yeah. It's Good movie. Samurai. I can't believe they predicted 300. It's crazy. They did. Um, maybe uh, maybe Snyder watched that movie and he's like, ah, Thermopylae, eh? <laughs> what can I do with that? Uh, Happy Jack Art says, I made a seven second stop motion animated review of Velma. I tweeted to Drinker and Mauler. I hope you see it. Oh, damn. I mean, I think both of us get about 10,000 Twitter like notifications per day, so it's, uh, you know, yep. sometimes luck of the draw, I guess, if we see it. Um, Pete McKelly says, with how much content is spoon-fed now, uh, nowadays, even if a movie is amazing, do you think it will even be remembered? Cheers. I think it, well, if it's really good, it should be. It's amazing, yeah. Yeah. Because that's the thing, like, it's almost like it makes them... But it makes them more rare and more notable if yeah. something is genuinely good because we're drowning in a sea of mediocrity with movies. Yeah, yeah. agree. Um, Eddie Brooks says, Thoughts on Jurassic Park, The Lost World, an underrated film and far better than Jurassic Park 3. That's true. Uh, Fallen Kingdom or Dominion combined. Also hated Last of Us Episode 3. Uh, well, fair play, man. But yeah, what do you guys reckon about The Lost World? Yeah. Well, I haven't seen it. I guess I can take the hot take that there's only one good Jurassic Park film. The rest of them suck. And as for how... I'm pretty sure I wrestle every day on whether or not I actually prefer 3 or 2. Lost World has problems, okay? And it was just so disappointing. You know, to go from Jurassic Park to that, like, it almost didn't matter that 3 was shit because it's like, well, the, the second one was kind of mediocre anyway, so it mm. didn't have as far to fall. But, yeah, it's just it just became a dumb... Dinosaurs chases people and eats them, kind of movie. Like there was nothing really to it. Uh, a lot of people saying they prefer three in chat. Kind of surprised. Really? To see. Yeah. Uh, well, fair play. Uh, Thor's World says hello. Question for all of you: Just how far do you think the new DCU reboot is really going to get? Um, so I felt, God, yeah, I mean, they're obviously going to spend spend a lot of bread on probably yeah. initi like initially, and everything's going to be contingent after that kind of first handful of of uh, films. And if if they do all right, they'll probably keep it going. But yeah, they I think that that first kind of initial uh, first impression, I guess, is going to be key for them. Um, because yeah, if they leave a sour taste in people's mouth, I think people are gonna bail kind of early. I don't know. You have to nail that Superman movie. Yeah. 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 So we'll see. Uh, the Astro Nerd Boy says, "Since you liked the Last Samurai, have you guys watched the 1980 miniseries Shogun? If so, what are your thoughts? Outside of the music, the show holds up well, in my opinion. That was based on the James Clavell novel, I think. Um, but I don't think I've seen the the miniseries, so." Yeah, I'm not, not sure. Uh, Blue Team Epsilon says, Hello, drinker, and here's a 10 for a drink. Thanks. Uh, I can't wait to see Oppenheimer, but I'm already scared it's just going to be a slugfest of super left-wing, anti-nuclear everything. Have a nice day. Well, I don't think Nolan movies are particularly political, so... He doesn't get that controversial with stuff like that, no. It's just... It's going to be a weird one, because um, there's no... Like, he can't have a crazy plot in Oppenheimer, can he? No. Nah. Right. <laughs> like, right. Oh, well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just it's my concern is like, am I actually going to give a shit about any any of the people involved in it? You know, or is it just going to be this really clinical, like documentary style retelling of past events? You know, yeah. if he yeah. if you can make me care about it, then I'll, I'm in. Mm -hmm. um, Thoughts on fitness says, please review Free Jack with Emilio Estevez. Jesus, <laughs> that's an old one. Um, Lance Johnson says you should have Jane Theory on. She is great. Jane okay. Theory is great. Maybe we will then. Uh, Shake from Hunger Team says nice to see Robert on again. It was nice to have him on. So, mm -hmm. uh, 
Robert Wiles says, uh, I bought your $50 Rambo drinker. Blessed to you all. Ah, oh, thanks, man. Um, yeah, that's my, my little Rambo comic. That's my tiny little contribution to the world of comic books. Um, but yeah, thank you for, for ordering one, man. Appreciate it. Um, Sandwiches and Mayonnaise says, Off topic, but I remember watching Tenant or uh, whatever it was called with my family and I could feel my brain getting hot because it was so hard to process. I think kind of we all had that problem with Tenet. I still it was not just, seen it. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's a weird movie. It's the best not thing fun about to it watch. to me is just, I remember seeing like a thumbnail or whatever that said like it's not supposed to make sense. I was just like, oh God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that, is that another one of those think piece articles where it's like, you know, this movie's garbage and that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, Mike Irish says, I'm just glad to see Gunn promoting the comics uh, the movies will be based on, something that Marvel never does. Uh, okay. Mm. Um, Slosher says, I haven't seen you do a review of Children of Men. I wonder if you've seen it. Yeah, I have. Uh, I feel like it's one of the many movies from the 2000s that didn't get as much attention at the time. Yeah, yeah I mean, it. I think it was... I don't know, what can you liken it to? It's got elements of The Last of Us now that I think about it. Um, from a cinematography point of view, I think it was like... It got a lot of attention because there was big, long, like, 10-minute takes during action sequences, like one continuous shot. So it was obviously a hell of a difficult thing to pull off, but it looked good. And Yeah, yeah I remember yeah, the it's, acting. It's, weird. it's like a movie that everyone, if you've seen it, you know to praise the hell out of the production, but at the same time, how many people have seen it? It feels like... Not a huge amount. No. Nah. Uh, it was maybe just it wasn't an appealing concept, I suppose. It wasn't like, you know, a straight-up action movie or anything. It's pretty bleak. Uh, Stolen Chance says, Mauler, I know how much you appreciate a good story and good filmography. You should check out Perfect Blue anime movie. It inspired Black Swan, and the director, Satoshi Kon, is an absolute legend. All right. Fair enough. There you, there you go. Tristan Reinhardt says, I'm glad you guys enjoyed The Last Samurai. It's my go-to answer whenever I'm asked what my favourite movie is, and it holds up very well under scrutiny. Yep, I agree. Mm. Uh, then in back again says, this one's from Mauler. Finally finished your Doctor Strange 2 video. Utter masterpiece. Chef's kiss, everyone. Uh, find someone who loves you like Mauler loves coming up with a million different versions of Benedict Cumberbatch's name. <laughs> Yeah, that took a while, but <laughs> I guess it was worth it. A lot of people found it funny. I, I think you were really pushing it when it was uh, the Black Widow review and you had to keep coming up with names for Taskmaster. Oh, I was running out so hard. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Taskmaster. Uh, I'll do a few more and then finish up. Um, Eddie Brock says, Last of Us Episode 3 could have been great if they didn't kill Bill off. Uh, he, he could have taken the wrong dosage and lived on to meet Ellie just like in the game. I mean, he could have, but then if you took the wrong dosage, wouldn't he just like do, take the correct dosage next time and kill himself? Well, and, I mean, you know, the story they wanted to tell was that he and he's a, he's not a stupid man. He's making sure, you know, he's he's not going to fuck that up. He's he's he said like this is enough to kill a horse. He's going to make sure the job's done twice over, sort of thing. He even thought to open the window so that the, the bodies wouldn't stink the house out. Yep. Legend. Uh, Shaker Silver says, Remember who Warner Brother last trusted to build the DCEU? Someone who dreaded it, sorry, drenched it in grimdark pretension. I'm fine giving Gunn a chance in spite of Cavill. I mean, I guess. I well, ever, nobody here has said we're not giving him a chance. Like, we'll, we'll give him a chance, sure. Right. Uh, we're just saying, like, what he's done so far isn't thrilling us, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, Pyro Rompa says, I'm not watching Last of Us, fuck Naughty Dog, and while I at first thought it was alright, after watching Az and Jane's review, Shaz's review, and remembering what actually happened in the game, I don't like it. Uh, I suppose that's an interesting position to be in, man, because if your first instinct was, I like this episode, and then <clears throat> you watch a bunch of people who telling you not to like it, and then you don't, it's like, well, did you like it to begin with? Or are you getting swayed? I don't know, man. I would yeah, I mean, kind of go with my own instincts with it when I watch something. It was the best faith interpretation is they gave arguments that you found really compelling, but at the same time, it's like, try and think on what gave you that feeling that first time around uh, on the episode, because, I mean, I, I, I mean, you know, cause a lot of people hate it. I, I've not been too convinced by uh, the main arguments against it. 
a lot of them are about the faithfulness sort of thing and just as far as i'm concerned like the game version of bill's story is supposed to highlight a path not taken for joel as in you get so locked off from wanting anything to do with anyone that you're alone and you're miserable and like a friend of yours being frank in that hates bill right in in the game this was trying to tell the same story in reverse the way i would liken this if, if you can kind of uh stick with me for a moment it's like how do you tell the story that dieting is important it's like you could do it with a fat man or you could do it with like a healthy man and the the fat man is like he's got a really bad diet and look at the bad effects it has or the healthy man has got a good diet and he's, he's like two versions of it that's how i see bill in the game is we're shown like the bad ending where he's alone and miserable and people hate him and he's antisocial. This version is he met the right person that got him to open up. He made friends like with Joel and Tess and he died with someone that he loved and he lived a full life. You know, like both mm. sides of the same coin, which is, hey, don't lock yourself off from everybody. You know, try and try and open up your relationships. And, you know, Joel is in danger of becoming that person in this storyline. And I think the same point, point is made. That's why I would call it faithful. Because I think I think you guys would agree, right? Like, being faithful doesn't just mean you literally copy, like, frame for frame and word for word. It's it's right. There's a lot more to it than that. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, it'd be boring as shit if that happened. Because then it's like you're literally going to know everything that's about to happen if you've played the game. So, yeah, you want a little bit of, like, experimentation or, you know, broadening things out. Um, Master Austin says, Hail Ripper, I enjoyed reading Isom 1 and looking forward to Isom 2. Um, Appreciate that. Shout out. A uh, question for the panel. I recently watched Raiders and Temple of Doom, such classic fun films. Which one is your favorite from the indie trilogy? Because there was only a trilogy. Mine is Last Crusade, apparently. Uh, so yeah, like, I guess favorite Indiana Jones movie from each of us. We watched them recently, Last Crusade by like a country mile. I adore that film. Yeah, man, it's been so long since I watched any of those. I I, I need to rewatch those. Certainly, uh, that's, I'm way more competent than I was at the age that I was watching that. So I need to go rewatch that, and make a more educated. I I think for me, it it used to be quite strongly Raiders, but yeah, Last Crusade's like really risen over the years, and it's like. Yeah, I feel like I would rather rewatch that than I would rewatch Raiders. So it's a weird, I guess it's kind of an odd position to be in. But yeah, I guess I would probably go on that. Nobody really picks Temple of Doom, you know. No, I don't. Yeah, no. Someone in chat will. <laughs> There's always one. Um, and Rooster Cogburn here says Abby will be played by uh, Amy Schumer. God help us all. Um, yeah, I just say do it, you cowards. Cast her. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, um, I know we've, uh, well, we've been going for like well, it's about two and a half hours. Um, I think we'll probably finish up about there. Um, but yeah, I want to say, Eric, man, thank you for, for coming on tonight for yeah, doing man. this. Anytime, anytime, um, man, I'll make it happen. And, uh, yeah, like the, obviously the, the success of ISOM has been awesome and, um, you're obviously gearing up for, you know, Isom 2 coming out pretty soon. Uh, wish you the absolute best of luck with that, Appreciate man. And um, yeah, yeah hope, it, hope you see even more success because you're doing great things for the comic book industry, just proving that you can you can do this independently and you can you can make it work. Hopefully a lot of other people follow in your footsteps. Yeah, hey, man, appreciate it. It's been, like I said, this is a dream come true, man. And just all the people that have been out there supporting uh, I still getting it. I mean, we get sales every day, man, uh, over at Ripperverse.com. So I, I appreciate everybody. And, yeah, I'm interested to see how people take the next story. Um, it's going to be even more thrilling. So I'm just excited. We're we're, uh, we're almost uh, finished with that bad boy. So, yeah, man, uh, like I always say, man, with, with you, everybody that's on, like, in our pocket or corner of the Internet, man, you guys were so vital and just that – word of mouth spreading because really that was where all the marketing came from we didn't spend a dime in marketing uh any traditional way so it, it was all word of mouth a lot of people just just uh showing people that it existed and that's what made it pop off the way that it did and i think uh we'll do even something uh maybe even more special with the next one so i'm excited and it's always good to just be here hanging out with you like i said man whenever uh either you guys want me man we can we can make it happen just let me know awesome stuff it's exciting All right. uh, you're gonna be launching the ripper multiverse right <laughs> yeah yeah no multiverses <laughs> over here <laughs> no multiple isoms we will not be doing that 
<laughs> uh, brilliant. No, thank you, guys. And uh, thank you for everyone that's joined us for the chat tonight, um, for the the uh, moderators who've, who've kept everything ticking over. Thank you, guys. Um, and thank you for, for all the awesome super chats you guys sent. Uh, if we've missed any, which we have, uh, we will definitely catch up on them um, over the weekend. So, yeah, that is all we've got for today. So go away now. Bye.